Hi, everybody. International Master David Proust here, and welcome to the start of the summer series of the Pro Chess League. I'm joined today by Grandmaster Amon Hamilton, my co-host, and Grandmaster Daniel Naroditsky, who will be playing for the San Francisco Mechanics. Welcome. Hey, David. So um, games are starting in about four minutes, so anybody who wants to play and hasn't yet uh, should try and go play uh, in this tournament very quickly. You can join this tournament in live chess. You have to be a member of either the San Francisco Mechanics or San Diego Surfers Fan Clubs. And then you go to that tournament link and you can play. You've got three or four minutes to figure it out. And uh, while you're figuring it out, um, Amon's going to ask a couple questions of uh, Danya before he gets set to play. Yeah, no, we're uh, joined here by Daniel Naroditsky, uh, who's going to be playing, obviously, in the uh, the upcoming format. And uh, Daniel, first of all, I just have to ask you, I mean, this is like a brand new format for you, me, pretty much everyone involved. So what do you think about the fans actually having a lot of responsibility here to potentially uh, bring home a win? Uh, I think it's fantastic. Um, it it feels I feel this rush of adrenaline being part of this collaborative match, and um, I think anything that involves fans who are excited about chess and that commingles, you know, GMs and young talented players and the fans um, is awesome. I think the NBA should have more fan uh, pitch in. So I'm glad that chess has uh, has beaten basketball to it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I, I think that uh, everyone is going to have, you know, a few choice words for those fans that either bring it home for those those teams or potentially lose it. But uh, there's also, uh, I was doing a little bit of research. Now, uh, some stats for you. You guys actually have the lowest uh, amount of people in your fan club in your whole group. But I see uh, it during the match today that you actually have more people that showed up. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> well, I think our fans are defined by their actions, not by their words. Uh -huh. um, you know, just like the Bay Area faithful, um, they might not be loud, but they'll show up when the occasion is important. So I'm very proud of um, the people who have taken time out of their, their weekends to, to play. And I had no doubt that uh, the Bay Area would show up in, in full force. And of course, San Francisco supporters across the globe, of which there are many. Right, right. Well, that's good. You've got the fan support there. Uh, one last question for you, because we do want to let you get set up for, uh, for your match. But uh, how do you okay, feel? I can lose on time. How do you feel about being in the same group as like Chengdu, St. Louis, you know, some of those final four teams um, and going up against them? Uh, well, I, obviously the Pro Chess League finals were in San Francisco, so I love the atmosphere. And uh, it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to, to kind of experience it and experience some of this greatness. And so I'll, I'll try my best to to play uncompromising chess, you know, and not detract from this atmosphere. Awesome. Well, good luck. We can't wait to see it. Thank you, Amon. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. Good luck. Have fun. Thank you. Bye. All right, Amon. So uh, now we've got one more minute to let people know a little bit of what's coming their way today. So first up, we've got a live club match. And uh, every week in the, uh, in, the pro in the Pro Chess League Summer Series, we'll have sort of a similar lineup of a live club match followed by a knockout, followed by a live club match. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have about three hours of chess. Um, why don't we look at uh, the rules for the live club match for a second? Right. Uh, you know, what do we be expecting to play for those of you who've clicked join successfully? Yeah, I think here we got the uh, the live club matches are basically going to be just 10 minutes uh, plus two second increment. And so the fans uh, get in there and you, you sort of select your side. You can only play for one side during this match, obviously, but you can play for multiple clubs over the whole season. And you play two rounds of uh, 10 minute uh, plus two second and, uh, and you know, try to try to bring it home. Cool. Um, so on top board, I... Daniel Naroditsky and Alex Costello will be playing. They're each manning accounts, which are called the SF Mechanics and the San Diego Surfers accounts. So they've got those official accounts instead of their own personal accounts. Right. So they'll be matched up on board one. And uh, we've got a few people right now switching from the San Francisco team to the San Diego team just to have some more, some more games and some more matches because there were a couple extra people on the San Francisco team. So 
there's a lot of people out there who are fans, number one of chess, right? And then number two of a team, I would say. That's true, because when you when you see one side, in this case, I think it was San Francisco who had a lot more players than the other side, at the end of the day, you just want to get those games in. So you might see a few people uh, switching allegiances here. Yeah, so it's cool. So we should have a good number of games um, there, and they should be getting underway right um, right now, you know, this minute or so. Games should be starting. So, um, yeah. yeah, so everybody be prepared for for that to start. Um, if you didn't make it in in time for this match, you could join a fan club for either Chengdu or St. Louis and play in the match that'll start two hours from now, roughly, um, around 7.15 uh pacific right. um so you can still you can still do that you can still figure it out otherwise um you could play next week or the week after um we've got a schedule of uh, matches for the summer series that spans about 12 weeks of quote-unquote regular season um three three weeks per group um so you know there'll be other teams coming up in other groups if there are teams that that you guys are bigger fans of you'll have a chance to play for other top teams like bot and bot and snowballs or or whatever i don't know if you had to play for a team what team would you would you play for in the summer series <laughs> um, are there any teams you love here you're hooping me i, I feel like there's only one correct answer of course i'd only play one. for the chess bras there. you would have to play for the chess I, bras i have to do it i, I feel cool. so much uh uh, camaraderie amongst the bras you know i'd have to represent cool <laughs> cool i think that personally i could find a team to play for in each of the four divisions because i'm kind of like a very i don't know diffuse fan like i easily find lots of people to like so yeah and I, i'm assuming that uh, a lot of the the fans out there um are not just fans of of one team so um, as yeah. much as they can, I'm sure they'll try to participate in as many group matches um, as possible, which is what we definitely encourage. Um, and then at the end of the day, they may have to choose between their two favorite teams uh, if it comes down to it. But, you know, that's a good choice to have. Yeah. So as you guys all saw, there's there's 12 weeks of these matches. There's also going to be a sort of, um, uh, what's it called, a summer series championship, I guess, with the top 10 teams brought from all of these divisions over the course of the season. Um, so there'll be 10 teams playing sort of like a knockout PCL championship match against each other at the end. Um, yeah, it'll be the top six teams and, and then some other teams uh, based on Twitter votes and things like that. So you, you'll have a chance to vote your favorite teams in possibly, even if they don't finish at the top of their yeah. division. And I, I think it's important to note, um, not only for something like this when it comes to a Twitter vote, but just how much of a, a role the, the fans really do play in this entire, um, this entire series, which is, I mean, obviously they're competing in the group matches, uh, yeah. gaining the most fans in your club uh, week to week can even affect things for, for your pro player. Like, you know, the, the San Francisco mechanic fans can help Dania get uh, draw odds in a tiebreaker if he needs it or help him get white in a crucial game against uh, another strong player. So uh, apart from just voting and, and supporting and getting games in, I think it's important that the fans realize really like, what, what a big role they're playing in this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, at that GM level, which you're a GM, you can tell people if they don't believe it, having white versus black, is that like night and day if it's a one-game knockout? Oh yeah, absolutely. If it's a one game knockout, like you don't get, get that rematch. I'm sure the guy who's uh, going to be losing the game is going to be spamming the rematch button to no avail. So <laughs> you want yeah. whatever advantage you can, take, I promise you that. Yeah. So, um, I just realized the games had started. Uh, it took me a second, uh, to realize that I had to actually like click on the boards. I was in this like pro chess league mode. Like everything was just going to pop up for me. <laughs> right, <laughs> Cause right. I kept telling, I kept telling fans today, like, all you have to do is join and then sit there in the room and the games will start for you. <laughs> Not the same for you and me. Not for us, no. So um, I've called up, first of all, the uh, top board matchup between the, the surfers and the mechanics or Costello and, and Naroditsky. Right, yep, I have and, that one here as well. Okay, cool. What do you think of, uh, of this opening here? Yeah, so first of all, the mechanics are, are black, so that's that's Naroditsky there, and uh, Costello playing with the white pieces. So far, I think uh, um, it's very fair to say that 
we're we're still in some uh, explored territory here. This mm -hmm. is um, still a very theoretical line here that uh, looks like it came from just a Rui Lopez. And uh, usually after after this, the knight uh, on e5 uh, often drops back to g6, and then mm -hmm. get these moves like potentially bishop to f6 or even bishop to h4 can be quite annoying. Um, and black's just going to sort of try to put pressure on the center and play on the dark squares for, for the meantime. I imagine white's going to play knight f3 to, to control bishop h4 and defend f4 with the bishop and try and play e5. Yep. And this move f5 is really going to challenge white to either trade and take the e6 square or try to push e5. Do you do you know any theory here about what's right? I think up to here, this is basically my theoretical knowledge. Like I knew that f5 existed and that's about it. Right, well, it's very provocative. That's what we can say for sure. And if you take a look at not only the board, but that time, uh, David, you'll see a three minute time advantage already uh, developing here. And we have to say that in 10 minute chess, to already be up three minutes, you have to put some value on that, whether you know it's 0.5, whatever you want to be. But uh, I think that's that's uh, indicative of the fact that Dania is probably quite comfortable here. And while he may not be playing the main lines, uh, he's definitely provoking this E5 idea. He's saying, you know, mm -hmm. come at me, E5, takes, takes. I mean, those pawns in the center look very, very menacing, but there, there's going to be some counterattacking happening there, like bishop B7, uh, if you go for that line, and maybe the bishop swings out to H4 still. And mm -hmm. I'm not so sure if White can maintain that. So either Danya's prepared, you would say, or he thinks it's a bullet tournament. <laughs> and I wouldn't put it past him. I mean, uh, some of the scariest moves from, from Danya come in 0 0.1 seconds. So okay. he's capable. <laughs> All right. So um, White chose the option of trading rather than the somewhat more tense E5 move. Um, and I looked briefly at knight h4 as well as bishop takes f5. So if anybody wonders about that, I think it would actually be pretty bad to play knight h4 on the previous move. My thought would be that white could trade once on h4 and then after bishop takes h4, put the rook on e6. And that's uh, maybe that's, that's like silly from me, but to me that looks like I wouldn't know how to dig out for black. No, I, I agree with that. I, I think those, especially when you think about the time control, those sacrifices are uh, almost automatic. Okay. So he plays simple, bishop takes f5. Maybe white is thinking a little bit too long about this stuff. I mean, yes, your opponent's prepared, but it's not going to, I don't know. Do, do you think five minutes is a little bit much to spend here? Yeah, when, when, you're, when you're opening up a time advantage that's essentially uh, double your opponent's, um, I think that's very significant. Um, we also have to keep in mind that um, a4 is, is he's trying to sort of tactically justify this move um, with like a takes b5 and rook a8 with the rook hitting e7 because mm -hmm. you have to remember bishop c2 and knight f4 in, in some universes is, is a pawn. So right. sort of justifying by like having this a takes b5 move, but I have to say it, it looks a little shaky uh, already. Right. Yeah, like even that, it's like maybe that holds together for white, but if you were playing like a game with time on the clock, you would check for black, like, are you sure that works, friend? Or can I maybe get this pawn from you on F4? And right. you know, while you're recovering on B5, I do something on the king side or you know, something could happen. Yeah, and I think Daniel is spending some time here because he's like, hey, hang on a minute. Like, I don't, I don't trust this. Uh, you know, maybe there's something I need to look for here. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, he just goes for B4 and says, okay, that threat's over. Now it's back to my threat, which was bishop c2 and knight f4. So white's again uh, got to deal with that. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. So b4, Danya's first time invested, comes up with b4, which I imagine is what, uh, is what Alex wanted when he played a4. So he's got to at least feel good that he played a good move there. Um, yeah. And now he trades and... What's I next? Think, I would think uh, developing his queen to d3 and bishop to d2 or something. The the move queen d3 looked a little um, misplaced to me because then knight f4 may come with a tempo. Yeah. Um, in some cases, which which might be helpful as an intermediate move. Mm -hmm. uh, but black has a very very easy plan of like either queen d7 and mm -hmm. then rook over or mm -hmm. queen f8 potentially just add more pressure. Um, or maybe even like c4 and, and the pawns start to roll. You, you never know. Okay, so he's looking at e6. 
leaving the rook on a vulnerable square for the moment instead of sort of cashing in the tempo too soon. Right. Um, and he's looking at a6 too in some cases. So this might be a nice square for the queen. It looks like it. Uh, queen d7 looks like the immediate reaction um, right. to something like this because then d5 would technically be hanging. And uh, if you play queen e6, well, I probably will take that. And let's not forget it. There's like d5 hanging, there's f4 hanging, and white's pieces simply just aren't developed on the queen side there. So if white then gets that pass pawn on e6 going to the end game, um, you're thinking that pawn's not really a danger of breaking the of breaking the blockade right now. So black's not risking much there. Yeah, um, I think it's mostly because I'll grab the f4 pawn, and yep. then if I if I couldn't, then I'd be I really concerned about like g4 f5. G4 f5 with a roll. Right. Exactly. Then but I if you know that you can take this pawn. And then basically the knight is currently completely unable to advance to challenge the bishop. So you've got time to get the other rook into the game and do what you like for black. Right. Right. The bishop is a sort of, okay. sort of really nice temporary defender. So Don just played queen f8 after thinking for a bit over a minute. Um, so another option that you suggested. So... Yeah, this queen f8 move, uh, again, you just have to remember that it's a 10-minute game. Like, we've been sitting here uh, checking the game briefly, and already his opponent is basically playing three-minute blitz, right? It's, right. It's, it's already down to a 3-plus-2 game, so it's like the guy's entitled Tuesday again or something, and he just needs to speed up. And there's, a, and there's a critical question. I mean, I am all in favor of speeding up, but there's a critical question for him what he can do about f4, right? Like can he play the move g4 here or not? That sort of has to be calculated. You can't just throw that move out there. Yep. Um, there's going to be a few calculations after uh, g4. First yeah. of all, rook takes d5. Looks like pretty suspicious, but it may yeah. be playable. Um, and then there's moves like not only knight f4, but rook f4. So I think yeah. it's something that is so annoying because as white, you got to calculate all three as black. You just calculate the one that you decide to choose. The one that you choose. And so the knight f4 line might be like one of the clearer lines. After bishop takes knight, rook takes f4. If white grabs the bishop on e7, the plan is to play rook takes f3 for black, I yes. imagine. Yes. I think and, that the better order would be to grab the e7 bishop first, although it's still very messy after knight h3 and rook f3. Okay, so e7 first, so that it's a little bit messier. You've got that knight weirdly placed on h3. Right, right. Maybe you can keep it trapped. Yeah, but it, uh, um, I don't trust it. No, it's some work to do. I mean, I see the knight escaping via like rook f2 check, king h3, rook other f... Well, you know what I'm talking about, yeah, but maybe yeah, other yeah. people won't because it's getting pretty long. But, <laughs> you know, we sack the knight, get rooks to f2 and f3, the king comes up to h4 and gets mated by pawns. So. Absolutely. Yeah, no, this is looking, I mean, look, under two minutes for white, and he comes up with queen e4. So I think yeah. I think already things are um, things are not looking good for, for white, who's having a hard time not only watching these two pawns, but getting developed. Like, let's not forget, he's got two pieces that really aren't playing the game, and Danny is about to potentially bring the last piece on a8 into the action. Yeah. Quick thank you to Wind for posting links to all four um, clubs in the chess.com chat. I'm going to try and like copy him over to the Twitch chat so that everyone can see that. That's awesome. Um, and uh, obviously, it's a little bit too late to play for San Francisco or San Diego this week, uh, but you can still play for St. Louis or Pandas tonight, and you could play for San Diego or San Francisco next week if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, all right. Queen F7 from Danya. Uh, I think allowing this G4, he seems to be ready for it. Whoa. Um, the Probably the line he's looking at is after knight E5 here, which is more or less uh, forced because knight takes E5, he has to take with the pawn, um, not the rook. And that's not what Daniel wants to play, but it is an extra pawn. And then he's about to play rook A8 to D8. Um, strengthen the center maybe with like bishop f6 or rook d3 coming in next and right i think he's uh, white's sort of happy to say okay i've got a nice blockade on the light squares a little bit bishop yeah you're trying to control everything so he's sort of he's done decently all yeah. things considered but at the end of the day that is an extra pawn for right a player like Meredith. so everything you said just happened 
the trade on e5, d takes e5, the rook coming to d8, bishop e3. Right. And it's true that white has avoided the worst and has some decent squares for pieces, but black still, in addition to the extra pawn, has hopes to somehow turn things towards the white king at some point. That's the other thing that can go wrong since black has the d file they can pivot from using the E or the C pawns, which don't look very usable right now, yep. to playing moves like you know Rook D3, Queen F6 to H4, something in that, in that realm. Yeah, um, I like the move that he just played, which was H6. I think he has the time to make moves like that. And yeah. not only does it stop G5 if he ever wants to plant something on F6, but it's a yeah. square for the king. Um, yeah, he wanted to, and he he must have not liked the idea of queen f6 g5. Yeah. Um, so he led with this. Yeah, no, I think with less than a minute for his opponent, um, I mean, uh, I think a five-minute advantage uh, for, for a strong player like this is not, not to be underestimated. Yeah. Well, I think there's also a little pressure on, on Danya now because... Uh, Costello's going to start moving fast, sort of like, cause he's forced to, right. And if you look at his last four moves, I see the time usage is like, you know, a couple, like a couple seconds. Um, and then Danya with like an extra pawn is going to feel the pressure to sort of figure out how to do stuff. Possibly. Well, I, it's funny. I think actually that, uh, Costello's moves have improved the last time he spent on them. <laughs> yeah. Inversely proportional to how much you think about the stuff. Right. Right. So somehow that's been the case and. That could work in his favor, as you pointed out. He's low on time now. He's got to play very, very uh, in instinctively. Uh, Queen c6, I, I like as a move because v, mm -hmm. although it it's nice on the light squares, uh, I think it places that pawn on a square where a rook d3 in the future is is going to make it very uncomfortable. So yeah. Also, I think White believed that rook d2 check was a threat winning the queen, and so they defended the queen instead of the a4 pawn, which right. could probably just be plucked now. But actually, the rook d2 move wasn't a real threat because bishop takes d2 would defend the queen with the rook on e1. Yeah. Unless I'm missing something, but I think uh, that, was that, looks, that looks good. And now the black queen, I mean, it got a pawn and we're starting to see the white. We're going to start to see the white king here. Yeah, we're, the move rook d2 um, looks like a serious threat uh, for black in this position. Rook d3 also hits the bishop in a very annoying way, so... I think at this point you're up so many pawns as black, your rook on d5 is going to give up defensive duties of those two right. d5, c5 pawns and just say like, okay, now it's time to, to break through. Yeah, only question is if you play like king h8 first for some reason, but rook d3 seems like in general the way to go. Yeah, rook d3 looks looks very good here. White would have to play rook e2. Danya's looking ahead a little bit before just blitzing out a move since he has some time. Right. Yeah, he comes up with bishop g5, um, and uh -huh. his rook on d5 keeps the major pieces out for just one more move. Um, mm -hmm. So, like, if rook takes c5 now, then just rook d2 seems to enter the position. So I imagine rook d2 here is basically going to be game over. Yeah, and, and he needs it because f6 is a nice shot, if not. If he didn't have a check, this f6 move could really mess him up. Yeah, I don't know. The thing is, your f6 move, if I don't take it, you're technically two moves away from something. So mm -hmm. uh, I have a free move as black, which is probably going to be queen g3 or queen takes h3. Yeah, which will be checkmate, right? And yeah, just, just one more move here. All right. Well, you could really see the direction of that game from start to finish, people, I, I hope. Um, you sort of saw how the extra pawn, but the bad bishop defending it was actually transitioning into this play against the, uh, the king over there. Right. And it looks like they're going straight into their second game while other people are still playing their first. So that's something to learn about uh, about how this live club format works. You don't all have to start the second round at the same time. And I see some people have already played two games. Um, that's so, insanely fast by the two games to be finished when technically one game could have still been going for five more minutes. Yeah, Danya still had half his, half his time, huh? Yeah, so we see a lot of games here. Um, a few matches have already been played, two game matches. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, Danya with B3, something he's played a couple times in uh, <coughs> regular pro season. At least one really good game, I remember. 
Right. Yeah. No. I think. Uh, I think he's just trying to to get a regular opening position. Nothing, nothing fancy. And oftentimes these B three moves lead to uh, so many other different types of openings. So um, it'll probably transpose to something familiar. Maybe he's going for a D four move. Depends if Black goes for D five or not. Yeah. So let's click around a little bit. Take the advantage of them being in the opening phase. I was thinking there would be a pause between their games so we could cl click on some other boards, but. Right. I think we're just going to use this moment here um, while they're in the opening phase to look at what? A game with one, two, three, four, five, six knights? What on earth is this? Is that Adnasov? That's Adnasov and oh, do, 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 do. I think you've got to close your other game uh, so that the boards look correct on your screen there. What do you mean? My screen doesn't look right? Well, you've opened another game, so it looks like it's shifted a bit. Okay. I will I have to close Danya's game for this game right. to look right. Is that yeah, the deal? Exactly. Okay. I know what to do for next time. For next time, I'll open three games before we start. Anyway, um, all right. I'm going to keep clicking through some other games because uh, I mean, this is like some <laughs> kind of weird art the guy's doing. But um, yeah, They're really having some fun out there. Um, it's kind of uh, crazy that the, the all right. match which actually finished as two games uh, to zero was the the top match basically right underneath these these pro players that we were watching. Um, it was like a 2200 took out a 2100, 2 0, both games done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here I've got another opening phase of NK123 against I Want to Be the Guy. Mm -hmm. um, and Black has really tucked things away pretty safely over on the king side there. Yeah, no, he's uh, he's really protecting the king. It's a new new variant. Yeah, he must have played knight f six and knight g eight this game. I mean, he spent a lot of moves tucking that king side, but white hasn't even done that much with the time, right? Like, white's queen yeah, side I, is just as undeveloped. You have to wonder what white was doing while black shuffled. I I have to wonder. It's it's white did a little stutter step with d three, c three, and d four, so that's where one mm -hmm. of his moves disappeared. Yeah, um, but. Uh, this, this f5, well, first of all, this knight g8 is not um, the first time it's been seen, at least. Okay. Uh, but when the bishop gets to c5 instead of e7, sometimes you can do it the other way around, where you play king h8, knight g4, and then when white plays h3, there's this line with f5, and you offer right. the knight for some f-file pressure. So this looks like uh, sort of the other way around. I'll go knight g8, f5, and hopefully bring the knight back to f6. Yeah. All right, so they're having a think on that. Let me scroll down some more. Let me find a game that's still like maybe in an end game from the first round. Cool. I found Moto Boys against Zogtastic. Right. I'm not sure which is on which team because I just clicked on it so fast. I guess Moto Boys is on San Diego. So White is playing for the San Diego team. Mm -hmm. And I guess Black's got a textbook knight here. Yeah. And then he trades it off. Textbook conversion of one advantage to another for a pawn he gives right. up that beautiful knight yeah no this is uh i think this is just, just going to get converted here um pretty convincingly unless he yeah. wanders the rook to some sort of like c5 and he's c5 takes... and rook c4 yeah that's yeah on c5 you'd have to throw in rook f3 check or things could get bad yeah but now yeah i mean it's that's a textbook of getting sort of close enough to the opponent's pawns that you can start attacking them from all sides. And yep. now he's got to pick which one to push. Um, at the very least, you have to credit uh, Moto Boys for, for his rating level, playing like Rook F1, Rook F7. Like he knows he's got to be, be active at least, not just sit there and sort of watch watch the pawns push. So uh, yeah. he's getting the Rook behind the pawn, he's being active. He's, he's doing all the right things. He's just in a lost position. Yeah, he just doesn't quite have enough pieces right. to work with. There he threatened him rook c7. That was also a good shot, practically mm -hmm. speaking. Yep. Um, I guess b5, b4 needs to come now. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Here we go. Tricky. Oh, there was rook c6, maybe. Just see where Rook c6, goes. king b3, rook c2, and queening. Perhaps he'd, he'd foreseen this. Um, so it looks like Zogtastic is going to convert this. Right. Congratulations to him winning the longest game of the first round there with that with that end game. 
Yep. Um, so shall we click back just quickly see how our how our champions are doing? Yep. Um, should also Estello, it's uh, yeah. eleven to nine right now, just in the overall match. So quite so quite close. Very close match, yeah. Um cool. So Costello here just got this B5 break against the pawn on C4. That's what that's what everybody wants in this structure. Yes. This is normally a good thing. Um, one way that white plays against it, though, uh, which is nice that he has the bishop on b2, is when, the let's say, a pawn takes back on b5, you play mm -hmm. uh, like b4 and mm -hmm. hopefully get your bishop to f1 and just, just put a lot of pressure on that, uh, on that b pawn. And that being said, I think mean, everything black's done is still very by the book. Um, but you might see Daniel just go for like try to play rook d1 and bishop f1 and and, and go for that pawn but i i, I like yeah. black yeah so far i like black too i mean if i had to pick which position to take i might even take black which is saying a lot you know just just 15 moves into a game as black against a really strong gm yeah i think the important sort of maybe tactical resource that that white has is knight d5 which i mm -hmm. think he's going to throw in after for example a takes b5 mm -hmm. um, because i think if a takes b5 you just had to make a move as white then you'd be happy yeah. as black but knight d5 does look annoying okay so it's going to threaten e7 it can't be taken because of checkmate on g7 um but what if black simply defends e7 i mean how big a deal is that after rook f to e8 right yeah rook f to e8 and then i guess you never know the repercussion i have like rook c8 you might have to take with the bishop um, I, yeah i certainly would a few moves at least coming with a tempo like a b4 another rook c1 coming next i see what you're doing here so you're leaving that tension for a while because black still can't take on d5 you're taking the c file with your rook you've got the c7 square maybe yeah and if things really go right you might have knight e7 check rook e7 queen d6 at some point yep yeah, no, this it looks tactically huh. sound for white. Okay, so white white's gonna have something in mind. Bishop takes b5 was played instead of a takes b5. Uh, so yeah, mixing no, things up. Like he, he saw this knight d5 and, and didn't like it. And I wonder what's exactly different about it if you right. play knight d5. I'm Let's gonna try something fun. Rook hanging on f1 to consider yep. as well. Let's try that. Bishop f1, knight e7 check. King right. h8, queen takes f6, right? Yep, and this uh, that's just like a, a cool looking finish. Now I wonder if it works exactly because there's bishop g2, queen d2, queen takes b2. Right. So king g2, oh sorry, king g2, queen d2. King here, queen b2, right. queen b2, bishop b2. This is going to like an almost <laughs> equal end game after all this nonsense it's yeah bishop takes a3 yeah. defends this and black gets a draw or better <laughs> like what the hell is going on <laughs> that's all basically equal so nonsense well yeah i i'm assuming <laughs> that that's like really tempting for white to go for <laughs> uh, yeah somebody's asking if white after bishop takes g2 can't play the troll move king g1 but the problem is rook takes c1 check because your bishop can't come off of that long diagonal in the weird tactical line we just showed Yes, but it's not a troll move. It was the first move I thought of. I just rejected it immediately. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I wanted to sack all those. I wanted to somehow sack like the bishop on g2 and the rook on c1, then walk my king out and win with just the queen, bishop, and knight. But yes, you can't. So not you quite. play knight d5. I think it's it's very tempting to to do that. Yeah, uh, because the thing is, at the end of that whole line, if I had to pick, pick a side, I would pick white. Um, of all sides, because I think I can plant my knight on d5 in that end game we got, and you know, mm -hmm. end for a little bit. Um, there may plus, even be a plus. version. Sorry, there may even be a version where you don't, um, where you don't sack on f6 and you play rook take c8 after the knight e7 check, right? And yep. then say bishop g2, king g2. Mm -hmm. Your queen's still covering queen d2 check. You already got the rook back on c8. Right. If anything, you're up upon and threatening Queen F6. Right. Um, so it's like not as cool as what we did, but I think we just take it maybe, like the Rook on C8, and then White has the option, the nice option of just Knight takes C8 in that line, right? Like we we can give up yeah. the whole Queen takes F6 dream and just take the material back and yeah. not losing our A3 pawn in that line. So it's like, hey, why not? 
Okay. Fancy stuff coming. Knight h5, tactic alert. I mean, we got to think about knight e7, rook c8. Hmm. Yeah, knight e7 just, it's kind of screaming. But this knight h5 move is, uh, there's no good way to defend the bishop on b2. Yeah. But I don't think we need to, right? Mm -hmm. I think, well, yeah. I mean, it's a good point that we don't have a lot of choices other than to go forward because the black queen's covering d2. I mean, how do we cover b2? Yeah. So knight e7. King h8, rook takes c8. Oh, they're playing moves, so let's just see it. Knight e7, king h8 have been played. Okay. Mm -hmm. So rook c8. I think black would play rook c8 there. But right. if you took the queen, then bishop takes check. It's got a block on f6, and it's not looking good for him. White just took every single thing. If he plays f6 and like rook takes f8. Rook takes f8. Right? Wow. It's like a... Bishop and two rooks? Blah. Well, the thing oh. is, F, F1 is hanging, though, in that line. Oh, okay. And then, you know, the queen comes down to E1, maybe, so... Uh, and, and Dania just throws in this nice move, B4. Play even another move, yeah. And it looks uh, it looks good. B4 looks like a good one, because then you have not only all this stuff we looked at, but even the bailout queen D2. Oh, even the bailout, that's not fair. <laughs> Well, when, it, when a Grandmaster has a bailout move on top of all these tactics, that's a good place to be in. Yeah. Wow. So I thought I thought that Costello did everything right. And then you said, well, there may be some tactical stuff going on. And boom, it's <laughs> just. Yeah, the knight d5 move really hits like a truck. Because uh, as black, you don't have a lot of options out of that. Um, your rook e8 move that you had mentioned earlier uh, just runs into maybe not tactical stuff, but just rook e8, uh, rook takes c8 and rook c1 positionally, just good for white. So um, it, it was a tough position there. Uh, here, I'm not sure if he has many good moves available to him. Queen d8 does not look desirable. So I'll just take on c8, I think. Yeah, queen d8 would probably go like rook c8, queen e7. That's just basically lost. I can see a few lines where, you know, like rook takes f8, for example, queen f8, and then white has to move the queen, black gets bishop f1, but the best that black can do is like, uh, you know, he's going to have, white has two bishops, a6 is attacked, maybe you get to an endgame, but you're down a pawn, and it just doesn't look good. Right. And that's best case. <laughs> and that's, that's like best a best case. case. It's like down a pawn with a positional disadvantage, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Tough. Well, we'll see what he can come up with. Let me click to another game. Got a rook and pawn ending between NK123 and I want to be the guy. Mm -hmm. Looks like White's got... Well, White's definitely got an extra pawn. He's deciding whether or not to take this repetition, the rook E2, E1 repetition. Yeah, I think uh, you definitely don't take it. I think uh, rook E7. Rook E7 should be enough to keep playing, right? Yeah. There it is. Good job, NK. You got the guts, man. You got the guts. And as Black, I think it's very correct what he did. Just take all those pawns. You're going to trade the C to the A pawn with Rook C2 soon. And right. uh, you know, technically speaking, uh, he's earned himself a draw, but uh, no doubt we will see uh, it being played on. The thing is, uh, White is actually a 1600. Black is a 2000, almost 2100. So I, yeah. It would be kind of really, really impressive to me if I saw uh, white, the 1600, uh, outplay black from this theoretically drawn end game. That would be something. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the plan of just trading pawns and, and going to the two versus three is, is I guess, what any GM would do in, in half a second, even in a tournament game. Yeah. From here. Okay, so um clicking some other games. How about OG Chess and Knight? How are they doing? There we've got material about equal right now. Oh sorry, it's not OG chess, it's OC chess, Greg. OC. Well, there's some tempting moves. That's for that's for sure. I mean, <laughs> it's always tempting to get the knights in there, you know, like just knight f5, knight h5. Knight f5, just put them all there. Yeah. Like a young Gary Kasparov. <laughs> it just feels good. It just yeah. feels good. One of his early quotes was like, once my knight gets to F5, nothing can stop me. <laughs> That's he was a, a Rui Lopez though. player. Yeah. So um, he, he actually just goes knight F3 
And after that move, I could pretty safely say that, like, for example, knight takes f3, queen takes f3, g6, I would feel very comfortable with black. Yeah, you've you've kept uh, you've kept white from getting that Gary knight. You've got the extra pawn in the center. Yeah. Yeah, as yeah. long as you can play well against this knight, things should be pretty comfortable for black. Mm -hmm. But if you let the knight get going, then it could be hard to play this position because you've got an isolated pawn and white is the first one on the e-file. So, I mean, all the heavy pieces from white are well-placed. Right. I would think if you don't play g6, it might not be at all easy this game. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, another one, David, if you want to look at a game that yeah. looks like fun, is uh, Anthony Atanasov against Odd Odd Dodo. Yeah. Um, that one is just all over the place. Whoa. We've got a double rook sack that yeah. must have just happened like moments ago, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a famous thing. Looks like it even started with a P sack first. Yeah, so rook was sacked in the corner. Knight sack here. Bishop g7, queen h4. Oh, White's best case scenario here was an endgame of rook down. The um, funny thing is, after knight f3, the, my my better senses might even tell me to just trade queens and say I'm up a rook. Yeah. Uh, but he just takes both of them. He's got no fear at all. No fear at all. I mean, he is sort of... I guess he's giving back the piece on e6, but he's got rook c2 check. and. Well, I, I think mean, queen c2. Just trade the queens off. No surprise that he would probably be winning somehow. Let's check on Danya's game to make sure we don't miss... Like major action after b4, Costello fought for quite a while, two minutes, and came right. up with rook takes c1. Right. Okay. Danya took the queen. Mm -hmm. He took on f1. And now I don't know who has what, but Danya finally saved the queen. So his queen, Danya's queen was attacked first. It sat there attacked by a bishop for like three moves. Yeah. And then Black lost the queen. Well, what the hell happened there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Black took both his rooks, which is definitely something. Yeah, um, it's, it's looking very, very good for, well, okay, now whoa. it's over. He needed bishop g2 double check, no? Uh, bishop g2, I mean, he just I think he just missed that, that the queen could take or something like that. Okay. Um, it's a little odd because the bishop could also take. So, um, yeah, there's bishop g2. There was also rook b1 as consideration, but... Right. In every line, it it's, it works out for for white, but not uh, not easily. Like bishop takes yeah. rook b one, mm -hmm. you're, you're very much playing. Right, white trades the bishop on g seven. Maybe we could bring the knight back towards e six since it's not great on h five. Mm -hmm. And well, it's, it I would basically say it's messy. I don't know. Would you favor anyone heavily in that position? I, I would heavily favor white. Um, heavily, okay. Yeah, pretty heavily. Queen takes d6, uh, mm -hmm. not only threatens knight g6 and queen a6, uh, plus a move like g4 is going to corral the knight and give my king ample space to, to work. And I, I feel like on the dark squares, I should be able to wrangle some control because that knight on g7, okay. if it ever moves, there's basically the checkmate on the board. Okay. So you don't think the black pieces can coordinate enough, even though nominally material sort of comparable. Yeah, it's comparable, but I uh, I would need to see like the rooks connected and maybe the king not like trapped in the corner and the a6 pawn somehow needs a better way to be defended. Oh, yeah, too many things. Oh no! Remember O C chess and, and the suggestion of G6 and G6 wasn't played. Instead, instead, d4 was played. Well, you mentioned and it. If he doesn't play g6, bad things can happen. The knight got to f5, and then there was no stopping him. And then I think it's also a bit funny that the, the guy's username is just knight14. Knight. Yeah. Just knight. <laughs> knight. Here comes my knight. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So Dan right. actually gets the 2-0 against Costello, and... Um, there's been a few two O's from his side, a few two O's from the other side as well, but yep. just tally up the scores. It looks like the match is going to be in the favor of the San Francisco mechanics. I've got a five game lead right now. Um, some games still going. I've got uh, moto boys on the screen. Zogtastic with white. Right. Um, 
motor boys with black we got the knight pair against the bishop pair that's definitely going to be fun to to watch or to see let's see art vega and t gregson i'll call it that game as well got a king on the run and equal materials that's that's a fun one yeah this this looks like uh, a good one to watch art vega you gotta corral that king queen f3 setting a trap queen e4 knight f6 oh yeah don't centralize like that all right he's alert gregson knows what's up mm -hmm. but still white grabs a pawn now if i'm black i would want to take on a4 or give perpetual which would you which would you say we prioritize here well, I guess it sort of depends uh, how I feel about because technically, uh, if this was you know real serious stuff, you, you'd be looking at the score, right? And you'd be okay. trying to say, okay, you know, I'm down six, uh, seven points. I, I got to get my team a win here. So I, yeah. it kind of depends if they're thinking like that. But objectively, a, a, a perpetual here would be a, a fair result. Yeah, maybe even playing queen f4 check wouldn't have been so bad for black because his king could go to c5 and, and b4. I don't know if that would have even come into consideration there. Yeah, these knight end games are, are the the worst in a, in a sense that like you can have an intuition about a, a position, but when you look at a rook end game or a bishop end game, you can usually say something definitive as a strong player. Like, this is a draw, this is a win. Knight end games, even strong players look at them and they're like, I don't know, man. I would do this move, but I don't know what happens. Well, we got a fair draw there, and I think there's only one game still going. And it's quite an interesting one. Let's see how it happened. Looks like an exchange has been sacrificed. Right. Um, oh, the knight got into e6. Oh, I don't know if black wanted that. Rook into c6. It looks like it might have just swung in Zog's favor. Yeah, it looks like it. No, this doesn't look... This doesn't look good. Probably a move like knight g6 is going to quickly lead to a knockout. Oh, like with rook c8 as an option? Yeah. <laughs> or knight e7 yeah. to c8. I mean, you don't have to be fancy. Yeah, knight, knight g6, I think it's lights out here, if he finds it. Oh, that move looks like maybe the opposite of lights out. That looks like right. lights on, bishop d4. It allows bishop d4, lights on. I like it. <laughs> Uh, doubling rooks on the C file now looks pleasant. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Certainly. I think, uh, I think, yeah, and he does rook H6. I was going to say, I think yeah. that he played queen G3 to set that up, so I was sure that he was actually going to do that. Okay. There may have also been nothing wrong with rook G6 there. That also looked uh, to the point. Yeah. Um, Hmm. Let me just see how that knight e6 happened for a second, because I'm going to go to move 25. Knight f4 was played, and black traded on e3, and he took on e6 instead of recapturing. So black sort of assumed a recapture there. Right. Knight e6 was played, and did black have anything brilliant or sneaky to do about that? Well, <clears throat> the annoying thing is after... Um... After like knight takes f8, there's always a knight d7 with a tempo hitting the queen. So, yeah, and there's threats of queen h7 suddenly from the knight on f8. That's true as well. So it's hard to imagine like queen moves, knight f8, then doing something sneaky with the knight on e3 instead of recapturing. It's not really gonna work. Okay. It doesn't look like it. So it happened as it happened, and. Uh... Now white's threatening queen f7 and queen h7. So presumably it's over. There's queen h7, h8, and then knight c6 check. Right. Yeah, no, this is... Uh, I'm su surprised the position like this isn't you know, already in puzzle rush, right? This looks, uh, <laughs> looks like it belongs. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Mm -hmm. He's found all that, and I think knight c6 is just going to put him out. Well, that's a great move as well. Yeah. It's like the position with six knights. He's got a choice of he's got a choice of riches here at this point. And there he goes. All right. Zog looks like a very smug little pink gumdrop thingy. Well, that's Patrick. 
well, Patrick looks like a very smug little pink gumdrop thingy. Have, haven't you seen SpongeBob? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, no. You're, you're going to get some flack for that one, David. That's, uh, yeah. that's Patrick the star. What's that? Oh, all right, everybody. Um, so that decides the first fan club match of the summer series in favor of the San Francisco Mechanics. Um, I hope everybody who played enjoyed their games. And uh, we will be back in a couple minutes after this little break to uh, see a knockout and then another match.
and we're back. I hope you guys didn't miss us yet. Amon, how was your break? Oh, it was great. Just uh, get a few snacks in and uh, get geared up for the uh, the upcoming knockout, which should be a lot of fun. Nice. So the knockout, the format, a little bit complicated, or at least new, an original format, right? Not the format used in previous knockouts, because I guess most of you are used to seeing two game matches, like in the recent FIDE Grand Prix, and we've got one game knockouts. Huh? How does that work? Yeah, the uh, the one game knockout is definitely why I was mentioning earlier and reiterating that the the fan support meant so much because you can actually get some of your players uh, the white pieces, for example, for that one game. And uh, you know, if they happen to tie, then you get them the draw odds in the tiebreak. So it's quite important. All right. So when we have the knockout in about uh, fifteen minutes or so, more or less, um, we'll be seeing Ferujan Akobian playing with white against alex costello ferrugian akobian is like the number one seed today not because of his 26 50 fide rating but because there were more people who joined the st louis fan club in this past week mm-hmm. um or in the past couple weeks than the other uh fan clubs so he'll have white and if he fails to win then a 15 minute game then he'll play a one minute game a bullet game with one second increment against Costello. Costello will then get white, but face draw odds. Right. Yep. So we have to think a hefty advantage to um, Ferrugian. Yeah, that's the thing with the um, uh, like. Can you can you get draw? I assume so. Can you get draw odds in the tiebreak game, uh, even if you have the white pieces? It's not like an Armageddon where Black always has the draw odds, for example. I think that. I think that the format is always that one player has the advantage and that advantage consists of white in the 15 and two game and draw odds in the one minute game when they get black, but I don't think they can get white and draw odds. Okay. Okay. So then it's uh, yeah, that's a huge advantage then uh, for sure. Yeah. And then we'll have John D will have that same advantage against Daniel Naroditsky. His Chengdu pandas are the second seed on fan club total. Um, but he will be outrated by Naroditsky. So maybe that match will be more of a toss up. I don't know what, what you think. Yeah. I mean, is there, any, um, is there anything to say about uh, Chengdu sending their fourth player to play uh, as like the, the representative? Cause I mean, he's just a massive underdog. Uh, yeah. It was, a, it was a big shock to me to see them actually picking this guy. Um, He's played quite successfully in the league all season, but obviously, you know, a 2,700 is still better than an overperforming uh, 11 year old. Yeah. Um, So, either, I mean, what are the options? The options are their 2,700s didn't want to play, or they really wanted him to get the experience, basically. Yeah, didn't want to or or couldn't, uh, depending on potential schedule. Well, they've they've got such a big roster. And like Lee Chow, you know, has like managed the team and been so committed to it. Right. Um, and then even if the 2700s couldn't play, they've got a host of 25 and 2600 players who could have taken the spot. So deliberately sending him, I would, I'm just guessing, I don't have inside info. I'm just guessing they wanted him to get that experience because he's their student. Right. Yeah, no, that could very well be the case. I think uh, experience or not, um, that's, like I, I don't think there's any other way to say it. That's that's a disadvantage for sure. Um, he's going to be the lowest rated, but uh, it'll definitely be exciting to see what he can do because, as you mentioned, I mean he's been overperforming all season yeah. long uh, and continue to do so in the in the finals. Have you seen some of his uh, games earlier this season? Yeah, I saw some of the earlier ones. Uh, I guess I saw less less and less as it got closer to playoffs. But the the ones earlier in the season were in, in some ways his more spectacular, and, and I did see those. Yeah. Um, do you think that uh, the white the white pieces are enough to give him a 30-40% chance in this in this match? Um, well, that feels like, I mean, um, if, if I'm not mistaken, his, his, his FIDE rating that he's working with, is it is it around 2,000 or something? Or yeah, it's like 1,900, 2,000. It seems kind of irrelevant. I think his performance rating was about 2,300, 2,350, if that... Right might be a more useful number for you to work with right yeah i mean like 40 percent um 
seems like ridiculously high uh, okay. statistically uh, against against a guy like Neroditsky. Um, so if you know if you have to call things according to to stats, which is what I've got to work with, uh, yeah. that seems that seems high for sure. Okay. Um, but you you can't uh, dispute the fact that he's he's performed all season. So you can say what you want about the stats, but he's been performing like a twenty three hundred. So there's always the feeling he could just play like a nineteen hundred one game. But mm -hmm. he could uh, also play like 2600, which is how he's getting that 2300 perf. Right. Okay. So, probably a, a big underdog still, in your opinion. Um, let's move on to the prizes really briefly, because there's a very important and relevant prize, in my opinion, for everybody here to yeah, hear about. So. That's the fan prize. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Um, for every three week um, division, there's a separate fan prize. So, you could be the best fan for these three weeks, or if you're not, then in the next three weeks, you would have like a new chance to become the best fan. Um, so you're saying best fan. Now, just to yeah. be clear, is this, like, is this a, a prize for like one person who's the best fan, or is it a prize for the club for having the best fans? No, it's a prize for one person who individually wow. is the best fan. So there could be only three people showing up to play for your team. And yeah. you could lose every single match, but one of those three people could be the best fan and win that prize. So how do you be the best fan? All right. How do you be the best fan? It's a mix of participating and playing, but also it's being more active with content. It's blogging about your own games, right? Blogging your experience or writing up like a story about how the match went for your whole team, maybe, or mm -hmm. streaming your games, which anybody is encouraged to do. Daniel Naroditsky was streaming his games um, right. and he'll stream this knockout as well. If anyone wants to check out his perspective, either now or on a VOD later mm -hmm. um, and gold dust Tori was uh, streaming as well. Her experience playing for the San Diego fan club. So, you know, anyone can be like streaming and that's a big piece of being the top fan. They right. can stream their games. They can post blogs. They can post clips. They can be active discussing stuff in forums on Twitter and et cetera. So it's all that sort of stuff together that says, hey, this person really like, you know, rallied a lot of interest for their team and, you know, themselves and the other fans on their team. Right. So I guess it's just being being visible. And uh, yeah, the, the blogging, definitely like you can just check the uh, the player's profile. So that's very easy to uh, easy to track who's doing that. And uh, and as you said, obviously, just being involved and, and being a cheerleader for, for your, uh, for your team. Cool. So, um, before the knockout gets underway, I was thinking we could click through one or two games that we missed, um, last time. Uh, I mean, during the live match, we didn't cover all 40 games. Right. So I've got chess player 2093 against chess fight stream. Okay. I guess everybody on a chess server likes chess, but people who put chess in their usernames often like chess even more. Do you know if this was their their first or their second game? This was their first game, I believe, with a chess player 2093 as white. Right, okay. And it's a four knights game. Do you see the same one as me? Yep, I got it. Okay, cool. Um, so, knight takes e5. I think this move was played in some famous game that uh, that somebody lost to Morphe as white after Morphe castled. Well, you don't want to be playing moves that are in tactics books for their losses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want to be the white side of NN versus Morphe. Um, but okay, A6 may not be the best tempo here after Knight takes E5. No, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, you you play a6 almost because white can't take your pawn. But if mm -hmm. white takes your pawn and then you play a6, that seems like the wrong order. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see how well or badly that, that pans out. I was just kind of thinking if black castled white would take on c6 anyway, perhaps. Right. Let's see. White castles here. And now... Yeah, now if black had already castled, a move like rook e8 might win back the pawn. For sure. Yeah. But as it is, Bishop D4. But as it is, what should we do? Bishop D4. I mean, we don't even want to take C3 and take E4 when we haven't castled. No, I don't. I think there's simply nothing to think about in, unless we're castled. 
Okay, so he just asked Castle, and he's not going to have enough compensation for the pawn here. Right. Still, bishop g4 without a light squared bishop is something. Something to bother the opponent with. And that's a good reaction, because here f takes e3 would be very pleasant for white. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is getting annoying for for Black, who, in hindsight, if you know he's trying to learn from that game, um, a six is a move you can save because uh, getting castled is is a lot more important. Interesting. So White willingly takes the doubled pawns on f three. Figures he wasn't going to be able to avoid that anyway. Yeah, the way that the bishop is on on b four, it doesn't look very menacing. So. I imagine mm-hmm. he wasn't actually that scared. He's just yeah, here the doubled pawns are not looking like a problem, huh? Yeah. You would think black would play f5 now? Definitely. Or, yeah? Yeah, I like that move. Okay. f5, try to claim some light squares. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's no getting around being, being worse or being down a pawn, but you can still make the best of it. f5 and you know, queen e6 and drop the bishop to e7, rook d8, c5. Something yeah, I mean, make a, make a big fight over this e4 square. Mm-hmm. If white ever pushes e5, I think it really increases black's drawing chances. Definitely. So, I, I, I mean, if I were white and I faced f5, I would want to fight for the e4 square as white also. Um mm-hmm. You know, I'd have to think between f3 and queen f3 and stuff, but uh, my inclination would be to still fight. Yeah. I wonder if white might have c3 and queen b3 in response to that as a way to. Uh, he might. c3, I guess I would, to do I would so. probably play bishop uh, maybe even all the way back or, yeah, maybe bishop f3. Yeah, I think all the way back is, is clever because of g7. So let's see my stupid idea of taking on b7. And then black gets my pawn on e4. I'm all for the chaos if I'm in a worse position. Yeah, you're like, please, yeah, bring it on. Yeah, this looks not clinical <laughs> by white. Right. Whoops. Yeah, no, I, I, I just the move uh, queen f3 earlier loses the e4 pawn, and the move f3 um, really invites uh, the f4 pawn to be targeted, and, and somehow the, the pawns lose, uh, lose their, uh, how dynamic they can be when it's just like f3, f4, e4. I think that the move e5 is almost going to be forced. So that, that looks like probably the last big moment for black. There. Last big moment for black, right? Because they played rook d8, white plays f5. Yeah. And now as an experienced player, you basically expect black to get rolled when you see this. Yep, for sure. Yeah, because white's just got the perfect pawn structure. The g file is annoying now, threatening bishop g5. Queen coming out with emphatic pressure against g7 and h6. Yeah, all and the yeah, this sort of starts to become sort of paint by numbers for white. Like, if you're an experienced player, you've you've won this position before. It's not even your first time. Like pattern recognition in the tactic, you just yep, you know what you're doing. He threatens bishop c3. That kind of forces Black's hand. So that was a strong move by chess player 2093. Mm-hmm. He trades b2 for f7, and uh, yeah. Gets the queen into f7, check. Now you can do a destruction sack on h6. Very, very clinical. I mean, if if you've never played this game, people, playing over it's really good because you'll get a chance to play a game that looks just like this at some point. f6, I mean, it's everything you want to know and learn. Yeah. Uh, the only thing uh, that may have been slightly more clinical, um, mm-hmm. maybe bishop h6 instead of queen f7, um, may have been potentially more precise. Sorry, say that again. Um, bishop takes h6 instead of queen f7. Could have been oh. more, maybe more precise. But cool, let's see the, that. The same ideas came in. Again. Oh, yeah, just devastating so that if they take, then you check. Very yeah, nice. Uh, That's worth pointing out. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, just to break through by, by force there. All right. So, everybody, the knockout's going to start in a couple seconds. That was, I, if I do say so myself, super instructive. If you learn nothing from it, then I'm lying but that's that's what i thought um or but, you're a very uh, strong player <laughs> what's that i said or they're just a very strong player if they learn all right or they're very strong and they've seen this all before <laughs> which some some people here probably have i mean 
chess yeah. player 2093 kind of played this as if he knew what he was up to i mean taking those double pawns on purpose and then <laughs> and then pushing them yeah to his credit once f5 was played uh it was very clinical yeah all right, so we've got we've got action. We've got St. Louis Archbishops, aka Verusian, in the house. Alex Costello meeting him with the uh, Gruenfeld defense. Is that what it is? Yep. <laughs> yep. This is uh, an opening that Var um, really, I would say, if I can say so, although I don't know for sure, really likes playing against. Yeah. Uh, he he sort of has these crazy deep files and preparation and. Um, uh, I know he's played a number of... The thing is with Grunfeld uh, players as black, they always play the Grunfeld. You know, it's kind of like uh, if yeah. you get a Grunfeld player and you're a D4 player, you know that you're just going into the depths of, of theory. As far as I can recall, I've only played the Grunfeld twice in like tournament tournaments, and the one loss was against VAR. There was no way he could have expected it and i think he did not play e4 an exchange variation i think he played like knight f3 bishop f4 e3 or something like that mm -hmm. um but he uh definitely knew what he was doing strategically once the game got underway it was uh pretty rough yeah the thing with uh with bar and the, and the grunfeld is that sometimes uh you can play against him and you get the feeling that he's prepared for you but he's just prepared in general like a mm. scary amount um and yeah like it's almost designed for you, but like that that could hurt anybody. You know, it's just you yeah. have to be the one. <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't even feel like the opening went so badly or anything like that. I just felt like once we were playing the game, like he really knew what he was doing. Like he put mm -hmm. serious pressure on me that there. Um, obviously, having only played it twice, I'm not the biggest expert on the opening, but I thought he played it well. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. We'll see. This will be a this. I mean, you also seem to think this is kind of in his wheelhouse. This opening, so. Yeah, very, very much so. I mean, um, so far, this bishop e3, rook c1 line is quite uh, quite topical, but black usually throws in the move queen a5 before castling um, mm -hmm. in order to encourage queen d2. That's um, what I thought. The main line is something like queen a5, queen d2, cd4, cd4, and trade queens, right? Right, or at right the very away. least, queen a5, and then you can wait and decide, but you've encouraged this queen d2 move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and maybe okay. Black just has a few more options if you delay it or or don't play it or something. Um, right. But as far as I know, Queen A5 is the most critical. Um, so right. he's coming to this 97th, totally, totally fine. The Grunfeld is a very flexible setup, but uh, Queen you can A5, get away with a lot of things. But this isn't yeah. the most theoretical line, huh? For sure. For sure. Okay, let's check the opening that uh, Zhang Di has chosen against uh, Naroditsky over here. Must be a King's Indian. Yep. I'll just click through it for everybody's benefit. You know, we've got we've got time. We can cover two games. During this knockout phase, there's only two games at a time. No fan participation for another, you know, 50 minutes, people, or 45, 50 minutes. So um, so we can cover both games. No yeah, problem. This is separate, I guess it's important to say from the the fan matches, like uh it still affects the total standings, right? Because these guys, yeah, these players are playing for for big points, uh value, yeah. but uh it isn't part of the regular matches. Yeah, in terms of the overall points and standings, which we haven't mentioned at any point yet, um, uh, the winning team in a team club match, like what we saw between San Francisco and San Diego, the winning team gets three points. Um, gotcha. Or if there's a draw, the team with more fans gets two points and the team with less fans gets one point. In this knockout phase, basically, they'll sort all four players, first, second, third, and fourth, and the first place player will again get three points for their team second place gets two points for their team, third place gets one point for their team, and fourth place gets zero points for their team. So kind of like there's six points at stake per team each week. Like you've got you've got a chance to get up to three points in the club match with the fans playing. And you've right. got a chance to get three points in the knockout from your pro player. Yeah, like if you look at the um, impact of, let's say, uh, losing a match like uh, San Diego... Um, against San Francisco, uh, San Francisco gets three points, um, and uh, San Diego gets zero. And then if San Diego finishes last in this, that's just zero points on the week. Yeah. Yeah, which is totally possible. I mean, it doesn't take much to 
to no, just lose a bit, right? I mean, the normal 16 game matches, you're always getting something, right? You're getting five, six, seven points, but uh, yeah, in the in the regular season, but here in the summer series, yeah, I mean, if you're just one step behind, I mean, you saw like a 40 game uh, live chess match, everybody, and like if one team scored 21 points and the other 19, the people with 19 are getting nothing. So it's it's very easy to just come home empty handed from a week. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, what do you think of Zhang Ji's opening here, his choice to play like D takes C5, I guess, in a symmetrical-ish uh, structure in the King's Indian? Um, I guess I have to also evaluate that choice um, a little bit based on um, based on who he's playing. So it seems like a reasonable choice in that sense. Uh, I don't think Daniel is so upset with, uh, with the choice by White either because he's got a very clear plan of... Um, in, in some future playing on the dark squares with 95 and 94 and I can sort of see that materializing he's going to play rook fe8 and watch the move 95 and always be ready to take him out with e6 so he can control d5 whereas white can only control d4 with pieces so um, the bishop on b7 and g7 look fantastic I, I think there's no doubt that that black is sort of happy with the potential to outplay here but that being said, it's like very, very easy position to understand. Um, mm -hmm. And that may play into Zhang Di's favor where it's like, I may be slightly worse by making these trades, but at the end of the day, I'm making trades. Yeah. I was just wondering about bishop to g4, you know, the piece that, that's not doing much, you always wonder what it could do for you. And uh, it could coordinate with the knight on d5 to basically make it hard for, I mean... He'd have to calculate h5 every move. I don't know if he wants to like dangle his pieces on g4 and uh, on and d5 <laughs> right. like that. Right. But I was just wondering if it could make things awkward enough for for Black that he can just plop his guys in the middle. True. Probably yeah, not. It, it looks suspicious. Uh, even the move knight b5. Um, if I go a6, for example, knight d6, um, queen c7. Even taking my bishop on b7, it's not necessarily an achievement for white because then the d4 square is all mine. And I believe that this bishop on g4 is a piece to watch the rest of the game and how it plays out because yeah. I can see so many future positions where that is the piece that white is saddled with. Right, and that he just doesn't get anything out of. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he went for a sort of more defensive control d4 for the moment, maybe wants to play f4 at some point um double rooks on the d file yeah i was just and about to say we're, we're probably about to see either f5 or h5 yeah i'm gonna say h5 bishop f3 queen c7 watches the whole diagonal there where the bishop or knight might want to move and the d4 square is probably blacks but f5 is him saying your bishop on e3 is actually trapped oh so he's just trying to win a piece there i was thinking he might throw a knight before first so that with f5, he could kind of corral the bishop on, F on f3, but yeah, he's, he's just he's going to try and trap thing. this piece immediately? I think so. And oh to my be goodness. honest, it's extremely hard to see why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I think here that it's probably fair to take with the e or the g-pawn. Uh, the mm -hmm. e-pawn is the one I want to take with. Um, yeah. but maybe there's something to be said about controlling the d5 square, although it doesn't look like the end of the world if white gives that check. Right. But it does sort of shelter the king on the diagonal that's open and cover that weak square. So it almost feels like a GF position, but let's yep. just try one of them. Let's try EF first. Sure. I imagine bishop f3 is the only move, and we can get on with f4 and show that this piece is stuck. Well, I think that what Zhang Di is going to slowly realize is that um, the move f4 by white before bishop f3 might be the only move because ah, okay. the piece. Let's go back to that. Not that it's incredibly good. In fact, I think it's quite bad. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, FG4 and then take H3 and there's a bishop on, on B7. So maybe there's going to be something like that. But I think this is, yeah, definitely trending in, in Daniel's direction. Mm -hmm. Well, in that version, you would definitely have wanted to play EF so that your queen could get out to H3 mm -hmm. instead of having lost your G-pawn. Yeah, 100%. Um, looks like they've played a move. So let's see. Danya played knight B4 before <laughs> taking on F5. So I almost had the order, but every order is possible. <laughs> True. Yeah. I was thinking that. knight before f5, but actually f5, and then with the stuff captured, then throw in knight before. That's that's cool. 
So he's so, going to be like queen somewhere. I don't think it necessarily matters. Right. Um, B1, B3, or D1. Right. Um, the thing about B1 is that you may run... Because let's remember, um, again, that the bishop is still going to be trapped whether or not bishop f3 trades the bishop. So like queen b1, I yeah. take the pawn, bishop f3 takes, takes f4, is still trapped. Um, and if I play queen b1 and we go for the line that we had looked at as maybe white's bailout option of taking on f5 and white playing f4 himself, then yeah. there may be like a bishop e4 move that shows up with the queen on b1 as like a right. first move. Yeah, and puts us somewhere even uglier, huh? Yeah, and it, I mean, then it's yeah. just... Then with the queen out of the way, I think we could consider just taking that bishop and, and taking h3, and that's that's probably good enough. Okay. I hear you. So it's looking scary. And uh, we got, again, a time advantage for Danya, 12 minutes against 8, and Jang Di is going to probably think even a little bit more about what to do here after night before, which is probably a small surprise to him. It certainly was to me. And that'll give us a chance to click over and see what Cassell has been able to do. I, I just remembered that's probably important in that position is that yeah. EF5 like can't be played in the same sense of like hitting the bishop and trapping it, like bishop h5. Like I didn't even occur to me that that move was possible. I don't know if you noticed that. But what's possible? But after GF5, like bishop h5 is even a move. Like somehow it didn't even occur to me that. Oh, uh, that it gives it another square. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. think about that if it matters at all. Yeah, I mean, it's still. <laughs> Oh, right, because you were still thinking white would play f4 there right, um, exactly. instead of so moving the bishop one way or another. Let's see. Okay, so knight b4 was played, queen d1, and Danya took with the e-pawn. So I think he's probably envisioning fg and gh, but I, I want to click over and see what Castell has been able to do yeah, about, no. uh, <laughs> about uh, Var's approach here to the, mm -hmm. to the green field. So Var quickly trades the dark squared bishops. And then he gets himself castled. Yeah, in, in general, like Grunfeld positions where Black um, doesn't have his dark squared bishop and has a position where he's playing like e6 as well as g6, it starts to get a little shaky. Um, mm -hmm. Now, by the same token, I mean, White sort of rushed the knight into e5. And whenever that happens, you've got this simple plan of like, okay, now I just got to attack. Uh, the d pawn as, as my source of counterplay but yeah. i have to say i'm a little i'm always very skeptical of that black position without the dark square bishop all right so let's look at this move e6 on move 14. um i mean the bishops have already been traded so that scenario is already in that dark square bishops have been traded and now he's weakening the dark squares more why does costello feel the need to play e6 here well i think in some cases he, maybe he's he's thinking that like uh, this is just a useful move to control the center because he's looking at d5, and mm -hmm. he's saying white might do d5 followed by c4. And right. Sort of get get in there like that. But I think uh, in a lot of cases, you you could consider playing without that and just accelerate, like hyper-accelerate everything. Take on right. d4, rook c8, like queen d7 or queen d6, and it's just like take on c1, rook c8, because trades are always good for black here. Right, with his queenside majority. The one time I ever won in the Gruenfeld was like this. Just traded a couple pieces right. and then played like a really simple equal end game with the A and B pawns against the A pawn. And, For sure. Because um, I think even in positions that we might see happen in this game potentially, uh, mm -hmm. where white has like a knight on e5, and if white ever plays like queen f4, you actually want your pawn on e7 defending your knight i just feel like that knight could only be loose in a lot of yeah cases. i think if you're scared of d5 basically you've suggested one option is to trade on d4 i think another option is to be prepared to answer d5 with c4 just so white doesn't get the whole center rolling Definitely. so any move like rook c8 or queen c7 might be playable here as well yep and then the idea is on d5 you play c4 you've still got this space advantage and majority on the queen side and you deal with white center as you need to. Like, because d5 is hanging, it's hard to play e5, basically. Yep. No, definitely. Um, and in other situations, too, sometimes you can even play moves like uh, either rook e8 first or just e5 uh, straight away and try to try to get a position where you've got that e5 and c4 pawns. 
Okay. So the last thing Castell has done is after d4 was defended, he played queen a3. So now he's he's found some space to harass Var a tiny bit. He's attacking a2. He's got bishop a6 in mind in some cases. Um, he's got pressure on the e4 pawn. Maybe he's threatening bishop takes e4 instead of bishop a6. That might be better. <laughs> yeah, no, bishop e4 and knight e4 are both serious moves. Um, I was a little more concerned about Black's position with like a knight e5, maybe queen f4, queen g5. Uh -huh. um, somehow so without this f2, f4 move, maybe. Yeah, I'm not so sure about this because a2 is hanging, e4 is hanging, bishop a6 mm -hmm. is a threat, uh, knight g4 is just like kind of always in the air. In fact, our queen is hanging because the pawn's not on f2. I mean, that's a big piece of right. the counterplay here. Right. So I, I something um, feels a little off about it. I would prefer this position with that pawn on f2. And yeah. then I could, first of all, there'd be no big threat. I could play rook c7, for example. Right. That would be like a great move if my all my stuff wasn't hanging. Yeah. Yeah. If you could just play rook c7 here, you wouldn't worry about stuff as much. Because black is not supposed to be able to just like give white the c file and, and you know, not have be punished for that. But here, mm -hmm. I think the product of f4 is that this is uh a little shakier than it should be interesting i don't think of var as somebody who pushes his f pawn excessively right. um more as somebody who would you know be looking for rook c7 mm -hmm. um but we're gonna have to pop over to the other game because it's like erupted in the madness that you predicted let's uh take a look is it following yeah. the, maybe that line where oh yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean it looks like both kings are mated but i'm backtracking to move 19 to just show yeah. people the moves that we expected um, so we had f4 played because if f4 was not played, if this bishop was saved, then f4 by black would have won a piece. So Zhang Di understood the situation, gets into this madness here, trades on f8, and then brings his bishop into the dark squares. And he's at least kept Danya's queen from getting to g4 with this move order, which is nice. Yep. Danya captures on g2, so he's definitely made contact. <laughs> <laughs> and Zhang Di plays Bishop F6. So he's made contact as well. Uh, you know, and he's got Rook D8 as a resource, and the knight on B4 looks out of play. So Yeah, I have to say the queen on F8 doesn't like the thing is, um, unless I'm getting to G2, something like uh even a future where I get like Queen F1 check, I'm just like envisioning some best case scenario. The king always has like King H2, King G3, like I'm never mating white so I, yeah. I get the feeling like queen h6 queen e3 check there's always king h2 like uh whereas white's threats are very concrete my queen goes to h6 rook d8 maybe i actually am getting mated yeah so actually it may be risky for Danya, even though he's got two extra pawns on the king side his king's kind of like bottled up by them and the white king has an escape route yeah i think knight c6 makes a lot of sense um Get back in yeah. the game, cover d8, but yeah. um, then rook d7 would be played, I think. Right. Yeah, exactly. Keeping the knight from going through e7, starting to look at rook g7. No, it looks it looks wrong. It, it looks like a bit weird. Bishop on g2 and a pawn on h3, like really do not work well together. That's that's yeah. not like a combo. Okay, he stopped rook d7, but he's at the cost of just completely saying goodbye to his knight. Yeah, I think he needs to play a move next, like h2. I was very surprised by bishop g2. Oh, he's threatening h2 now, isn't he? That's nice. Come on. Right. Right. Um, I was surprised by bishop g2. I mean, I thought, like, you don't want your bishop on g2. If anything, you would want your h pawn there. But honestly, you know, I would think you want to move, like, you know, knight c6 or queen f5 or something. But you don't, it doesn't even help you to put your bishop on g2 in right. any way. To win the game, you need to put some other piece there at some point. No, this got like uh, very, very messy in a way that will definitely, no matter the result, probably favor uh, White just based on the the kind of match mismatch. Let's say that we're looking at. I think he's right. very happy to be playing this position. He's probably going to play, and he just played Knight F4. Yeah, the the H pawn is just not making an impact. Yeah, now on H2, he also has his rook covering the king sideways. Cool. Um, as well as the possibility of blocking with his knight on h3 if he wants to play king h2. Queen g4 is is going to threaten a lot of game-winning moves. Right, if you right, right, right. Um, yeah, it just looks really good. Uh, 
rook e8 and then queen f7 might be an idea for right. Danny. way to dig out would be to start with rook e8 so this rook d8 stuff doesn't hurt as much and then we expect maybe queen g4 from white and queen f7 covering g6 right extra and then white still has to find i mean it looks scary for black but white's still going to have to find some good moves yeah i think something not to forget about is a, a nice resource is always going to be a3 um to just force the knight to go to a6 and just yeah. put it offside and then get back to business right goodbye it makes rook d6 stronger yeah um to the point of maybe winning maybe even rook d6 first threatening a3 so there's not even knight b8 but, for sure, yeah. And, and that could happen in any order, right? Queen g4 might not be necessary. Maybe rook yeah. first. Uh, I think white has all the play in this position. Yeah, looks very, very scary for black. And we see Danya spending significant amounts of time. I mean, he had a much bigger time advantage earlier. So, One thing, I yeah. guess, the, the sort of ace in the hole for black is that um, if I play queen f7... Um, I'm hitting C4, which maybe, right. even at the cost of like A3, for example, I could take that as an idea. Um, if I ever, ever get my queen in front of my bishop, that's yeah. very bad news for white. So either In fact, in the exact line we showed, instead of knight A6, right. you know, queen takes C4 would probably be the move we'd have to look at there for Danya. Um, you know, realistically, it's got the idea of queen, C, queen C1 in some case, or mm -hmm. uh, it stops knight G6. So it's it's... Queen e4 as a next move. So that's the move that that he might be counting on. Yep. Um, or at least something that they've that they both got to keep their eyes on. Let's pop back over to Verusian, his game. He's making use of that F pawn now. Let's yeah, see how it happened. Worth, uh, pointing out that he used um, a very thematic idea in um, mm -hmm. it's actually, I guess, not necessarily from the Grunfeld, it's more from the uh, from the Tarash. Um, yep. but it looks the same and you sack the pawn on d5 to block not only the bishop but you take the square from the knight and you say okay black's pawn on d5 is actually on my team it's taking away all that action from black's pieces and then you say e5 f5 and let it roll yeah so by contrast everybody what we mean by taking those away is let's say we played e5 for white here which would look kind of like naive to a lot of strong players then black plays knight to d5 mm -hmm. and like this knight's amazing yeah. He's got the C file. He's got the long diagonal. <laughs> He's got his queen in here. And it's looking super scary for white. Right. Um, you know, maybe you play queen d2, queen b4, and have to go into a nearly lost endgame. So d5 is played by VAR. Um, and then e5, the knight has to go somewhere else. Bishop on b7 is out of it for a while now. And he's going to try and use that time to checkmate the black king with f5. I think it's important to note that queen c5 fails to knight d4. Like, there's no way to get the queens off. Otherwise, black mm -hmm. would take that immediately, I think. Queen c5 would deal with things pretty well, if not for knight d4. Yeah. I wonder if Var is, like, doing this out of, like, desperation or if this is, like, good for white. Yeah. Um, I think that the answer could be both. A little bit uh, of both. <laughs> but but I, I definitely think that it was born of desperation. Like, I, I think that black's position was... A little bit correct you know like when the queen was on a3 it felt good and white had to spend this time playing rookie one and something felt like it should work for black there um but thematically this this is very correct what what var is doing okay. oh interesting move from jang d in the line that we looked at knight f4 rookie a queen g4 queen f7 here he played knight takes h3 Defending the C pawn with his queen and planning to play knight g5, disrupting Danya's coordination pretty badly. Um, I wonder what what uh, what Danya's going to do about that. It took him three minutes to find this idea. Zhang Di, he's down to less than two minutes, but this idea might be enough for him. Maybe queen e6 uh, has to be played. Yeah, I mean there is h6, but then I'm not sure the effect of like queen h4 or queen f4 or something. Uh, specifically queen h4 so there's no king h7 yeah so that'll be interesting but let's try and evaluate let's try and evaluate this other game that we haven't gotten as deep into so f5 king g8 was played so if he goes f6 going for just checkmate with queen h6 
Black does always have Queen F8 in reserve for the moment. Yeah. I so VAR that. decided that's not dynamic enough just to have that sort of checkmate trick. I mean, it might go like F6, Rook C3, mm -hmm. Queen H6, Queen F8, unless Queen C5 wins, and he doesn't even have to go Queen F8. Right, that's also possible. Yeah. Well, that's too rough. So basically, okay. So basically, he goes e6 instead. f6, f6, and rook c3. This is feeling like a very good chance at a huge upset for Costello to me. I mean, like, he's, he's black against a 2600 player, and he's got all kinds of tactical shots here. Um, he's got a few. I think the most important thing is that um, VAR is not at risk of the queens coming off because I'm not sure how that position looks there if he does go for that because e7 is so strong uh, as the right. next move. Queen takes, and if pawn takes, for example, e7. And Well, if pawn takes, I, I would probably seven. grab the knight first and then play e7. Okay. That's because otherwise, maybe not. Okay. That'll be even more curtains. Yeah. Nothing to do there. So, oh, he has played queen c5. Huh. He I thought he doesn't have to take with the pawn, though. He can. Right. Take... That was the sort of like silly, silly move. But the other option is to bring the rook back to c8. Mm -hmm. But I thought he had a good game going in the middle game. I didn't think he would go for queen c5 there. Yeah, I think the, the problem is without queen c5, I guess he was a little concerned um, about his king and maybe like rook f1 and queen h6 and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if this works, like basically he's a, he's a very, very close to this being a very good end game. Like if the king gets yeah. to seven or if he corrals that pawn, he's doing fantastic. You're right. He pretty much just needs to know that the e pawn is under watch by his king and then he's got everything again. So... This could be a way to win as well. Rook c8. I, I still have my suspicions about this. Rook c8, bishop b5, <laughs> knight d6. Because let's remember, even like rook takes e4, pawn takes, and bishop b5, um, I'm pretty sure that is up a piece for white in that endgame. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. This is something something untrustworthy about this continuation here. Yeah. And we'll have to go back and see what he could have done instead um, at some point. So he goes knight d6. And I'm wondering here. Yeah, this doesn't look good. Are you on the other game there? I just I just clicked for a second to see which game was going to be decided first. I was trying trying to like pace it, you know. Yep. Um, so they're all they're we, both actually heating up tremendously. Yeah, they both look like they're at the decisive tactical phase. <laughs> um. So here, I guess on knight f six, king f seven, it's not over yet. That's right. But That's right. as you say, it's. It's not trustworthy, this situation from black. It looks so rickety. Yeah, uh, like I, I wonder about a move like bishop b5, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, rook e6, knight e8 doesn't help, right? That's uh, not, yes, that's that's not helpful. <laughs> so that covers the fork, and the king can come to f7 at some point. Also, uh, a move like rook f1 should be on the top of of the radar like bishop b5 and rook f1 look uh look like moves to consider yeah but yeah rook f1 rook e8 and then king g7 i don't necessarily see it like maybe king g7 first sorry and then rook e8 hard to rook say six. i don't know a minute each. It's intense. It is. I'm not so sure about rookie six after ninety eight. I'm I'm curious what he's gonna play there. Uh huh. I just wanted to say that uh, Bishop B five is is happening and 
Right. So this just comes back and keeps the king off of the rook. Now the rook's in here controlling stuff, and he just wants bishop b5. And it's tough to dig out. a6 allows rook takes b6. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe d4 to play bishop d5. I don't know. See, I would want to challenge this knight. I feel like you really got to challenge the knight. And if we ever got back to that point where he traded queens, my idea was actually to attack the knight with the queen rather than to trade queens. But right. I don't know if we'll get there. Um, it's right, really so hard. Stella's yeah. got 25 seconds and Jang Di has 19 seconds. What am I supposed to... Bishop b5, all right. I think that the, the Zhang Di game may be a little more tactical because um, actually in the uh, Akobian game, White's yeah. actually not threatening anything. From not threatening to win the game. All right, then let's not click over here for a second. Right. To the open kings. Knight to g7 is played, attacking this rook. One answer would be knight f4, maybe. Counterattacking a rook. Um, knight f4 yeah. looks, like a, looks like a very decent try. Positionally... As a first reaction, positionally, it looks like an improvement for Danya to have his pawns on dark squares. His king's not as checkmated in every single variation this way. Yeah, like uh, I, I like the look of like a move like rook f8 here or knight f4 because the king hides on h7, and I think that black is not getting meted. Okay, Jang D offers a draw with 18 seconds on the clock. It would be bold for Danya to sack the exchange and not take the rook on e2. <coughs> I think in the other game, there may be yeah. some ways to win here. I'm getting the feeling like bishop takes e8, bishop e6, bishop a4 is, is decisive, although he's found... 15 seconds for Danya, 10, and he takes the draw. All right, we're going to click back to what you were saying. The rooks have been traded just now. And white wins a he's piece, gonna, maybe? He's here, yeah. Yeah, 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 he wins the piece. Yeah, and I don't actually think there should be um, much difficulty closing this out. but Not uh, too much, but it is now a bullet game, basically, right? So yep. No, this is, still, this is still something. If it were bullet, you wouldn't be resigning, and it is bullet. What's he going for? He can still play h6. Yeah, the bishop just watches that pawn on a2, and at this point, you're just ready to say, okay, worst case, bishop takes b3, sack, and my king and... I got and then win on the king side, right? Even with two on two. Yeah, well, as I was saying earlier, David, like when, when you give a GM a bailout option as good as that, plus the actual position, it's probably too much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, so there's going to be a bullet game now between Danya we, and Jang D. Yep. Yeah, and here he's got the option to just trade his knight for this pawn at some point. Uh, no, he's definitely messed this up. Now, now this is just a draw. Oh, that's a terrible knight move. D2. He should oh. go to C2, right? Instead of A2? Oh, that's a terrible move. What is VAR okay. doing, by the way? One more chance. Whoa. Oof. Okay. He oh, king to the wrong square. I think any square. There was off. no right square. There was no right square. Yeah. Wherever he went, he could trade it off. All right. So Varo is the first one to get into the uh <laughs> into the second round of the knockout. Whoa. So first of all, Whoa. after um <clears throat> after knight d2 on move 59, uh black played king a3. Um the correct response is to just play king g4 to f3 to e2 and just guard your knight and then and then just proceed like with the king side pawns um just to like let's say avoid all the the possible headaches um now if you calculated this you know yeah. of course i'm not going to question it because what he played absolutely wins but um, yeah no that would be a cold so. option but also i mean just like on move 58 right king a2 was just wrong just king c2 and it's a draw Atrocious, but I, yeah. I also think that VAR with 20 seconds on his clock, like I have no idea what he's up to. Like, what, why is he running his king all the way to g7? And like, I mean, I think he, he should know that this knight and this knight doesn't corral the pawn. Like, it's not. Oh my gosh, the bullet game's going. It just popped up below. So, 
let's look at this thing. Let's just see this. This is the tiebreak game. Yeah, so this is the tiebreak game. Plus one second increment and one minute plus one second. If, uh, if Zhang Di draws, then basically he wins. Yes. But I mean, Daniel is not only a huge favorite, but I think this is approaching checkmate after Bishop G3 or Bishop F4 is game over. Yeah. Yep. H4, Bishop F4, and mate. Oh, he found it. He found it. <laughs> well, that was a violent uh, con conclusion there. Bullet games are so quickly satisfying, huh? <laughs> yeah, the, the problem is that um, I think that the disparity between the players is magnified like a hundredfold uh, in bullet. But D uh, Daniel's like an insanely good bullet player. And um, the draw odds are, are nice, but I, I just don't think that, you know, many of Daniel's bullet games end in a draw, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, what percentage of bullet games do you think are drawn? It's got to be like pretty low. It's not the biggest advantage at this level. Yeah, it's, it's fairly low. This is one plus one. So you have to take a sample from one plus one games. Yeah. If I think of like the speed chess, uh, championships, which use that time control, um, mm -hmm. fair to say that, that statistically a lot more are drawn than regular bullet. So that's at least something. Um, so I think it matters, and it also, whether or not it matters statistically, it's going to play into the heads of the guys playing that every move you're thinking, like, oh, I shouldn't trade that, or I can't trade that, or I know he's going that's to. That's right. So it I gives you a lot of options just knowing that. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. So it may have a much bigger effect than the stats would, would tell us. But, um, yeah, that king just got, just got wrecked by those bishops. Yeah. <laughs> no, that, that didn't look good. So, All right, so we'll have the two 2600 GMs playing each other for first place in the first Summer Series knockout in a minute or so. And uh, I got to make sure I notice when it pops up because I've got all these sort of closed games. And yeah, I just got to be on top of that. I think that uh, as, as I just replay what happened, I think that uh, Dania took the draw because he was like, wait a minute, I'm about to play bullet game as a tiebreak. This is easier than playing a one pawn up opposite Bishop Endgame. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he he just probably accepted the draw because he he knew he was getting a bullet game. Makes sense. Yep. All right. Here's the first one popping up. Uh, San Diego Surfers. Alex Costello has black against uh, Chengdu Pandas. Uh, that's the that's the third fourth place game. And here is Var against. Danya, and we've got a King's Indian, which is uh, one of Danya's signature openings. I mean, he plays like a whole ton of different openings, but uh, this is one he goes to pretty often. Right, and if you if you think about the effect that the the fans can have on on the matches, uh, you can see it in action here. Is that Bar has had uh, two whites, and Danya has had two blacks as a result. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, usually I hate on the Kings Indian. That's what I usually do. But um, I would say for this matchup, it's not a bad choice for uh, for Danya in this specific matchup. I mean, there's some op other openings where I think Avar is being more dominant, and then this is Danya's best opening, so or arguably best. Right. <laughs> he did play it in a Benoni fashion, actually. Right, with E6 and... He takes d5, so he did actually invite some Benoni stuff in there. Yeah, and VAR chose e takes d5 over cd5, which I think is also a good choice for VAR, if I were sort of like coaching him move by move while being hundreds of points weaker than him. I would tell him, like, this plays better to your strengths than going for the cd5 structures. Yeah, um, he would have also had to have played the opening a bit differently because the way that Daniel played it, he didn't give him an option of cd5. Right, he would have had to play like a queen c2 or knight d2 right. there Something to move else. before, of course. Yeah, but he could have arranged it if he wanted to play. Yep. No, he probably um, knew that he was going to play e d5. Yeah. So Var just gets to play white all day. That's kind of nice. I mean, like, yeah, two, exactly. like the advantage is nice for one match, but to like every match, yay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, just uh, thank, thank you, fans. <laughs> 
Yeah. The fans are wondering if you ever just drink water directly from a tap. And the answer directly is, of course, of course. You just sort of get under it and yeah, all the time, man. Yeah, I think I think everyone's done that. There's definitely certain places in the world where I feel more comfortable doing that. I'll say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, 94. Immediate action. There's like things hanging already. Uh, so what's up? Bishop g5, queen to d2 I don't feel as great about, but it is a developing move. It looks risky tactically, but sometimes just developing is good enough. Yep, queen d2 looks... Um... Looks playable. Uh, D6 is hanging, so it kind of narrows down my options, but queen f6 yeah. is potentially an idea after queen d2. Right. So queen f6, um, bishop g5, queen b2, trade it, trade it. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. I want to play bishop c3. Right. But yep. it's also possible after bishop takes b2 that I throw in a move like bishop d3. Bishop d3 there, yep. And then rook e1, rook e1. And uh, black will have an extra pawn, but white's got you know rook e7 or bishop e7 coming. So I don't think yeah. white's going to be... I'm not even busted. sure it's extra because I have rook e8 and also rook b1. So yeah. I'm not sure how to deal with both. Yeah, and bishop e7, rook. So you've got four things. So something's going to come back to, yeah, exactly. to white. Exactly. Okay, so white played bishop g5 in response to rook e4. Mm -hmm. Queen b6. And uh, okay. okay, he's just played knight d2. I was going to say you're probably between knight d2 and bishop d3, something to sort of make that rook do. do something. Right. So now stuff gets traded. Up, and there's sort of counterplay on the e file and counterplay on b2 i don't know who's got the main play and who's got the counter but um I, my sense is oh yeah so i guess queen e8 was such a big deal he had to play knight d7 first and now he's kind of struggling to fight back on the e file yeah you can play a move like um knight f6 let's mm -hmm. say, and then just try to bring the rook to e8. Um, right. Prioritize the e file. That makes sense. Queen e7 you can handle. Right. And bishop f6 first, then they don't even have queen e7. So. And maybe he goes knight e4 in that case and tries to trade more. Uh, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, games like the pure end games favor white uh, without question because of the, the nature of the, the d6 pawn and just the, the dark square pawns and the pieces that are on the board. But yeah. if there's pieces on the board before a pure end game, I think the, the activity favors black. Right, like some, some positions where black will have like a bishop on d4 or mm -hmm. a knight on e5, there are versions that could be pretty good for black. What do you think of g5? I wasn't surprised by h6. I mean, it doesn't cost him anything. Now the bishop can't go to e3 to counter d4 or whatever. It's just reduced its options a little bit, and his king can go to h7. But g5, that's... I'm very surprised, um, mostly because of the move knight e4 right here, mm -hmm. um, which, which will prevent rook e8. Uh, and I think that this is going towards what I was getting at uh, in terms of a bad, bad endgame, where the pawns are kind of getting all in dark squares. White's got this h4 move coming up. And as soon as white gets like b3 or h4, swings yeah. the rook to e1, I, I think white's much better. Oh, this is rough because knight e4 was hitting d6. I think he was basically obliged to trade it. Yeah. And now if he plays a move like, you know, king f8 trying to play rook e8, white can possibly just play rook e1 and it's just like too late to fight that file. Yeah. So queen a6, that basically just looks desperate to me. It does look desperate because now things are just going to get uh, messy, right? I mean, he's going for this because I think if he sits there any longer, b3 happens and white's just clearly better. Yeah. Uh, he wants to mess things up, takes, takes, bishop d6, uh, maybe a move like rook d8, followed yeah. by c4, where he's threatening like c3, he's threatening the b2 pawn with c3 next, he's threatening d5 with the rook and queen. Yeah. Or maybe just rook e8 to have like the e2 square in bishop d4. True. <clears throat> yep. And then maybe like a, even a back rank threat on, on e1, queen takes b2 ideas. Oh, Far's trying to end it. 
He's trying to end it. Well, yeah, this... Hmm. Queen d7, and then if d6, queen d6. So queen d7, rookie one? I think queen d7, d6 is playable. I mean, takes, 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 bishop c5. I think white is, you know, he's he's going to be better there. Still better there too, yeah. That is an extra pawn. Um, but maybe... Yeah, I, I don't know about rook d8. I was actually thinking that c4 was... Uh, was kind of tricky with with like an idea of c3 and rook e8 but ah yeah that that is a sneaky move c3 i i i suddenly realized like that Danya may have played a little bit too fast like the pace seemed normal to me and then suddenly i looked and he had like 12 and a half minutes on his clock and it's like there's like three pieces left on the board right it's and the game. game's kind of decided i wonder if playing that like one minute game put him a little bit into the wrong pace into that mode yeah yeah bishop e7 is a strong move um no matter if you play bishop f6 or bishop f8 there's always d6 and rook e1 like you can always protect that more than enough um no the best i'm seeing is like maybe queen d7 and playing that pawn down end game is what he should do but it's really not pretty at all is there anything in the move queen b7 maybe not much like queen b7 forces rook to e1 right you could grab on on b2 or something but white's still just following up with d6 now he's happy to trade queens and then you can't control the d7 square so right. i don't know if that does anything <laughs> um of any use so what about queen so what about your hmm. i'm trying to combine a few things but uh yeah. the annoying thing is that okay maybe um maybe what uh, what i'm trying to say is after queen b7 rook e1 i'd love to play bishop f6 b6 and like get a trade of the bishops first and mm -hmm. then be able to move my queen around with that pawn on e7 but i don't think it can happen okay so he's looking for bishop d4 with counterplay or something but oh this is so shaky so shaky Yep, this this looks uh, fishy. What do you think, King F one maybe? A solution to King the back F1 rank. D four. Um, I wasn't sure about that. Then I would play maybe Queen E two, just trying to play D seven. Mm hmm. Queen E two seems good because I actually have no square on the board that hits D seven at all. Speaking of that, maybe I should just play Queen E two to begin with. Why even play King F one? <laughs> yep. Because then you're threatening rook d1 and just push. Like I, I, I think, um, I think Daniel's lost. So somehow I, I want to say that, but yeah, I just haven't calculated everything, so I don't want to jump to any conclusions. But yeah, uh, it looks really bad. Since Var played bishop e7, that was my instinct. It was like, oh, this is over somehow. Um, queen e2 looks like a nice, a nice move. I mean. We're kind of sticking with this game, but it's because it might end before we come back to it. Yeah, I mean, I could I could mouse over the other, see if it looks decisive. It looks pretty intense as well. We can always come back. Yeah, that game will will still go for a little while. They're they're playing a, a theoretical Grunfeld line. So here, I guess the other reason I was leaning on that game is that's the first place game, which maybe yeah, it's like a we're bigger deal than the third place game. But that said um let's give some respect to these guys too so Zhang d is up a pawn for the moment yeah this, Costello. this whole thing though it sort of stems from this theoretical bishop takes c7 line on move eight which is okay. um, from speaking to a number of grunfeld players like the bane of their existence um it is like such an annoying thing to face because what you see in the game is a completely theoretical line and all oh, right right at move 12 i mean if you were a gm and like a 2200 were prepared i'm not sure how you'd even try to win <laughs> yeah it's it's super annoying white just doubles the rooks on the c file leaves that bishop on c7 where it's just like you can't control it and then he's also controlling the dark squares there oh my goodness that um, looked that looked very easy by Zhang d yeah it's a super annoying line and now that bishop on b1 isn't good i mean Yep. No, I think he's. Uh, I think he's very much 
in Canadian. on the brink <laughs> on the yeah. brink of losing this one i think white can go rook a7 to a6 by now yeah just take everything bishop back to e5 i mean the the most black could hope to to take is like one of these pawns but at the same time yeah. bishop on b8 actually controls h2 from a distance. right so rook h1 maybe knight d5 I mean, yeah, knight d5 <laughs> how bad can that be for white <laughs> man no, this the bishops are not coordinated for black there's no checks there's nothing i mean this is a pretty pretty bad position for him there so var played queen e3 pretty similar to the queen e2 idea um just trying to get rid of the defender of d7 yep uh if queen d5 on queen e2 i was planning to play queen b5 that's the one difference is on queen d5 i'm not sure how white immediately wins here um i mean i still yeah. imagine there's a way but well, queen e2 just seemed better in, in every regard because queen d5, I mean, there's also rook d1, which is just, oh, sorry, there's bishop d4 in that case, I guess. Yeah. That's true. So, yeah, queen b5 is, is much, much different. Yeah, I don't see what the immediate win is. Nope, it doesn't have one. Yeah, it doesn't have one. That's not an immediate win. I mean, it's a move to say that you don't have back rank threats anymore so like yeah. GH, then you don't have to take back you obviously you won't you'll do something else yeah does he want to do queen h3 after that it's like weird move i don't know i wonder if black could play bishop f6 now in this current position after h4 yeah. yeah i mean he's got to dig out at some point your, your queen's not going to stop d7 for the next 10 moves by herself is she i have to say the move uh queen e3 seems very perplexing okay i don't get it because like queen yeah queen e2 just looked like like a better version but i i'm convinced that i'm missing something now because i mean he can see that as as much as we can uh, yeah but on queen e2 i mean i don't even know what the next move is for black i thought i sort of like crossed every possibility off mm -hmm. like queen a5 there's d7 right if the queen tries to stay on the rook on e1 and on queen b5 <laughs> there's queen b5 right and on trade queens you can't stop d7 i don't know anyway they're doing something h4 bishop f8 kind of like bishop f6 hg okay Right. So he could take on g5 or he could trade on e7 first. If he takes on e7 first, then on gh6, he's got queen d6. So white would have to take back, I think. Yes. Would white take with the queen, though? Check out that. Queen that's e7. You already good. looked at that. Yeah. That's a good move, I think. Okay. Very good move. Um, I don't even like you have to play what rook uh f8 after that or what's going on perhaps but then even d7 threatens queen f8 rook e8 yeah i mean gh6 is crushing there as well so bishop e, bishop f8 doesn't even threaten to take on e7 that's a problem with that move i think yep. <laughs> that that's that's a good point no your queen e7 is just like lights out and he's played uh, it oh oh no he's played it yeah oh, <laughs> oh man <laughs> I mean, this is over. Yeah, that is rough. He's got to play like, ugh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's over. I was to, he played it on the board just so I was about to spit out the awful rook A8. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, I mean, I, I spit that out in my head too, but like, there's just no point. I mean, just D7 at will, right? And then Queen E8, whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah, he knows he's got d7 like whenever he wants. So he's, <laughs> he's like, I'll take h6 too. Whatever. Yeah. Because now rookie five is also game over. Yeah, um, quite, quite. So. H2 and h5 is covered by the rook. So rookie five <laughs> looks quite good. Indeed. Queen f6 is also just literally checkmate in one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which is pretty strong. Pretty yeah. strong. That's game over. I think he's going to resign right on the spot. I do as well good call yeah good call all right so um man that got uh that got out of hand once bishop e7 and d6 happened you just 
I think he quite got like that. when Daniel missed knight f6, knight e4. As soon as I saw knight e4, I thought mm -hmm. that was something he might blunder. And uh, unfortunately for him, like he wanted that knight on f6. He thought, oh, he just rook at e8 next, that everything's cool. But he sacrificed a lot of positional things to make that happen. And then when you're stuck with a move that you can't even execute your main plan, all that's left are the positional weaknesses you created. Right. I mean, a move like b5, he's just flailing around because he can't fight for the e-file. Um, yeah, and, and he took that, all these nasty complications, because he was like, if I sit in a position where I just play like rook d8 and queen c7, it's just bad. Like a guy like mm -hmm. Barr is going to milk that position uh, all day. Right. Rook d8, <laughs> b3, queen c7, rook, yeah. rook e1. Just awful. White's so, got the f5 square and h4, and ooh. But yeah. the game would have probably lasted longer than it did. It lasted a bit longer, yeah. But maybe not give any better chances. It might be longer, but you've got an even less chance of anything. Right. Of, of any mistake from the opponent. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, let's click over to this other end game, see how, see how Zhang Di, the young, the young one, is doing. Yeah, I think uh, Zhang Di is sort of handling things here. Uh, yeah. I mean, He's collected all three pawns. Yeah, he's just taking he's kept it. H2 covered. He's given up nothing yet. <laughs> and you shall have nothing. This is uh, quite annoying because it's just two connected pass pawns. I mean, I, he could consider a move like bishop f4 here. Uh, mm -hmm. He could consider king f2, which looks mm -hmm. like a pretty good move. Yeah, I, I wonder what's wrong with king f2 because at first that seems very nice. I don't know. Yeah, King F2 looks like the best move. Yeah, there he goes. Props to the kid. Yeah, Props. I think Rook C1 and Black wants to play Bishop D3 and like Rook C2 or Rook F1 is some idea. Um, mm -hmm. Bishop H4 can be answered by Bishop G3 if necessary or King G2, also good. Um, but yeah, he's just like cool, collected. He doesn't care. Yeah, I was thinking he might go Knight E2 there. Um, yeah, but I, I, yeah, I don't see what can go wrong for white here, basically. Yes. <laughs> looking, looking nice right now. So he has one idea of like giving bishop h4 check and then rook c2 just to force the king backwards. Mm -hmm. The rook is on prees on c6, so he can't move the knight just yet. So he might right. consider something like rook c5, but then there's rook c2, and bishop takes e3. So the move I actually want to play is like bishop f4. Okay. That's what I want to play. Yeah, I can see that. I imagined also the move b5 to defend the rook and try and queen the pawn. Um, right. But then bishop takes b5 can even be played. It could. It, so it doesn't I'm, even work. If I'm sort of like imagining the horror stories, then... Um, bishop f4, bishop h4 check, king g2, bishop f1 check, and then it's like you get mated. <laughs> All right, bishop h4, bishop g3. No, not bishop g3, king g2. Like, let's say they play king g2. Try ah, to king g2, yes, that's bishop a horror. One, and you're just, like, you're just getting mated. <laughs> yeah, 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 that could go wrong. Because the thing about bishop g3, at least I thought, was, oh, then then I play rook c2, and your king actually has to go backwards. Maybe that's not ideal. Yeah, yeah. All right, he played bishop f4, as you um, suggested. Yeah, I think bishop h4, it just feels like the tricky move here. Because rook yeah. c2, king g3, and I'm just going up the board safely, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, so on bishop h4, he's got to play the bishop g3 move. Mm -hmm. And then on rook c2, king e1, there's not any particular threat against white just yet. Correct. Correct. Then, then we're back to the drawing board. Because <laughs> huh. the second you have a moment, it's just like a4, you know, b5, just game over. So yeah. white just has to stay off. He's like tricky bishops and then and then he's right so black's trying to like compose some kind of weird checkmate basically with two bishops and a rook no knights no pawns and he has to like set up his checks laboriously and then every time he's not threatening mate white can advance the queenside pawns right 
that doesn't feel plausible for black. Yeah, Jenkins, uh, I mean, he's been too consistent to walk into something like King G2 after Bishop H4. Like, he's not the type to, to fall for these little tricks. Um, when he plays move like Bishop F4, it's, it, it feels very clinical. He, yeah. he Bishop H4, Bishop G3, put your king on the last rank, but uh, you're going to push those pawns. Yeah. Hey, Var had kind of an easy day so far today, huh? Two whites, two wins. Look what a difference the fans can make. <laughs> I'm just thinking it must feel pretty good to be him right now. Like he probably doesn't feel like, you know, tired or, or scratched or anything. Just like keep setting them up. I'll keep beating the, the Kings Indians or the East Indians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's spending a lot of time here because he doesn't have any good options, quite honestly. Yeah. There's not much to do. He's uh, he's going to face the music soon as those pawns are going to start rolling. Yeah. Um, so while he thinks for a moment, oh, there it is. Um, I just tell everybody one quick thing about um, prizes, which is that actually there are <clears throat> prizes for each knockout, like week by week. So in the normal pro chess league season, basically you have to get to the finals or you have to get to like the end of the season. You have to get to the postseason, win a round or two, and then there's like a bunch of prizes for the top teams. Mm -hmm. um, with the summer series, there's basically money like every single week for like you know first place, second place, third place in this knockout, as well as you know sort of um, you know the fan prize over the course of the three weeks, and then later the prizes for the team for the you know half the teams that get into the playoffs. But every week, each of these knockout players has a chance to to just win some money right away yep so the threat is rook c2 and taking on e3 what's uh what's next for the uh for the youngsters technical right. effort here oh so i've been uh trying my best to find ways to lose i feel like that's almost like the mini game now okay so you're not trying to find like the clinical technique you're trying to find what are the traps what could possibly go wrong yes i'm, I'm having more fun doing that yeah uh so my latest one is F4, yeah. uh, rook c2, just to throw in, king f3 by, yeah. by white to yeah. just go up the board, and then black yeah. plays bishop f1. Nice. And then white plays bishop f2, and black plays bishop h4. Oh, that's nasty, I'm on. Does knight d1 save this one? No, nothing saves this one. <laughs> yeah, nothing saves this one. Nice. Just trying just try to mess the poor guy up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oof. Because it looks almost likely that you, you'd go king f3 up the board and and that, uh, you know, maybe overlook something like that. So it, oh, uh, he doesn't even give the check. He played uh, f4, but the check was not thrown in. Well, there you go. My imagination is, uh, I, I got nothing now. I'm going to run dry. Because there you go. Once the rook goes on a on a square where it's protected, you got yeah. all these knight moves now. Now it's just plain and simple, I think. Maybe he plays h5. I don't know. Try to trap that bishop. Yeah. Knight d5 will deal with that, unfortunately. Oh, uh, yeah. Kind of. I mean, that's the move white's angling to play for, so white's going to see it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I can't, can't allow knight d5 anymore because that'll trap sort of one more trade of pieces huh. and if he just checks on the second rank then the white king goes to e1 and d2 so so um i'll play rook c2 okay and then king e1, e1 i'll go h5 now all right i'm just gonna just gonna play like the obvious move walk into knight d5 and I guess I'll throw that check on e2. Yeah. King, I suppose. To, to d1. d1, yeah. And I was wondering if, uh, if there's any hope in a position where I try to get like opposite bishops and leave your king there, like rook a2 or something. Mm hmm. Yeah. Thing is, white doesn't even have to hurry knight f6, right? They could play like rook c3 or something. Yeah, true. 
True. Yeah. All right. Let's see what they did. Something's happened. A rook check was played, and then e6, stopping knight d5, maybe. Very fair move. Looks like a very good move. h5 coming up next. Uh, bishop e7 to sort of dislodge the rook from its nice square. Yeah. It's important to note that not many knight moves work. Uh, knight d1 looks like it either loses or walks into rook e2 for no reason. Knight yeah, yeah. And looks like it walks into rook c5, knight b5, rook c5, and nowhere else to go. So it's, it does restrict the knight quite a lot. Yeah, the knight is quite restricted here. So that's, that's pretty good. Slight squared bishop's got almost free reign. The bishop on g3 is almost buried. So the there are e7. some... Bishop e7, I like this move. I, I like putting that rook on a square that it's not protected. Mm -hmm. Sorry, how, how does yeah. one not lose a piece here? After bishop... e7. e7? I mean, maybe you could do some version of sacking in exchange, but let's see. Um, or I guess he's going rook c6 and e5 now that the c2 row is attacked rook c6 king d7 b5 i'll tell you though david i have my suspicions here you know we got like bishop a3 yeah like, uh, th th this looks like way too much is being permitted right yeah because bishop b5 is also a viable move king c2 bishop takes c6 i would maybe consider it after i grab that a3 pawn right Sorry, everybody, to show his last point. So I'll go back to this, this, this. I'm on saying in some cases he might be willing to go bishop takes b5, king c2, bishop c6. Certainly, if he'd already had time for bishop a3, oh yeah, then for this sure. would be this would be fine. So, uh, so I even seven. have my suspicions that with the pawn on a3, it's still very reasonable because of there that. might be some chances there too. Yeah. So he goes this way. Um, after bishop a3, what would white have? I mean, black also has the idea of bishop to b4 next. Yeah. So he doesn't even have, he's not even restricted to just that bishop takes b5 idea. h5 was played here. Uh, I mean, h4 is a, is a nice move because you got rook h2. So yeah. I, I totally get it. Um, something tells me whether you wanted to do this or not, that bishop e7 first is, is absolutely correct. Uh -huh. like, just dislodge the rook, maybe even just rook c6, don't play king d7, then maybe play h4, or sorry, h5. But uh, yeah. it feels like that bishop b7 move is so discoordinating to deal with for, for white. Yeah, but I can even I can even imagine Alex winning this game with black now. He's down okay. three pawns. I can imagine it now. If h4 and rook h2 happened... Me too. That could be the way to win the game while white's not really doing anything. Why force the issue with bishop e7 if white does nothing and lets you queen the h pawn whoa -oh. he's doing something well it's it's just that the move bishop e7 like if the rook is not on a defended square that this is not a thing so i i don't even need oh, bishop no. e7 because of my queen side stuff yeah I need bishop e7 to just put the rook on an uncomfortable square and then even your idea h5 h4 that's fine but th this, yeah. is, this is completely wrong this is the problem he he couldn't allow this But, but, oh man, B Bishop B7, and then I'm on board. Then I'm on the team of like black can definitely win this position. Not playing Bishop B7 there is like a, a huge miss, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you're white. Uh, this is Jang Diaz white against Alex Costello. And I think you got to play A4 now, but we'll see if he does. I've seen one or two positions in my life where a bishop controlled three pass pawns on one diagonal <laughs> yeah i am uh, not optimistic here yeah that looks like they're rolling anyway yeah yeah b5 king d4 so yeah th this is not over now completely anyone who's wondering how to win this <laughs> with great technique should take a look at how he's pushing the pawns just make sure you put them on light squares because you got dark square bishop for the other color yeah He wants to make sure to give away all his pawns first. Yeah. He wants to get rid of the H pawn to have stalemates, but it's it's beyond over. Good game for the kid. 
So the kid got some valuable experience. He drew a 15 minute game with Grandmaster Naroditsky. Yep. Right. I mean, like, really, he like fought. It looked like he might just lose out of the opening, and he fought hard. And yeah, then he, hard. He's great he lost that. a bullet game with Danya, which which happens. I mean, I don't think there's anybody who hasn't lost a bullet game to Danya, or, or multiple like me. <laughs> yeah. And then he beat Costello. So good experience for the kid. I would say his coaches couldn't be too upset with his performance today. Yeah. Thumb, thumbs up there for sure. He uh, he definitely did well in this game. I have to say that um, Black's resistance was was a little unimpressive, and mm-hmm. a few moves here may have put uh, Zhang Di in, in a more precarious position. But with the moves that were presented on the board, I thought he handled them all very well. Yeah. So tournaments, there should be there should be a tournament like basically ready for the other. I think, uh, yeah, it starts in, in 15 minutes from now, and I guess people can, uh, can join, right? Cool. So we're going to take a short break, everybody. When we be back, when, when we be back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> when we be back. You know. When we be back, we be with Grandmaster Verusia Nakobian, winner of the first Summer Series knockout, and uh, he'll tell us how to beat the East Indians with white or something like that. Um, so, sure. yeah, see you all soon.
everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we are joined now by Grandmaster Verujan Akobian, the uh, winner of the first summer series knockout. Bar, how do you hey. feel? Hey, guys. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm feeling great. I haven't played for a long time, you know, so it was kind of a, uh, you know, good that I played today, and I, it looks like I played uh, decently, you know? Yeah, it sure looked like that. That was the impression that, that uh, we all had in the, uh, all the fans watching, and, and Aman and myself as well. Um, before we get into our questions, I just want to quickly plug your team um, to the fans because there's still nine minutes before your match uh, against the Chengdu Panda Fan Club. So I just want to let the fans know that they still have nine minutes where they could join either the Pandas or the St. Louis or mm -hmm. Chengdu or St. Louis fan clubs. Get into, uh, get into live chess and uh, go to this link here and then join that tournament. So if you guys want to get involved and in a couple minutes, that's how you can go play. Um, so now, uh, Bar, uh, you were just telling us about this uh, game with Danya, um, and you thought that if he didn't play B5, it was maybe not so bad for him. Yeah, well, I think uh, also when he played Queen A6, probably his intention was already to play B5, you know? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard to tell, but I think just D5, I don't think it works. Unfortunately, because the d6 pawn drops and and uh, may, maybe perhaps you can play like a little bit slower there, but uh, yeah, after g5 it's probably slightly worse because the problem is he could never get f5 in because f5 f4 because f5 always runs into queen e6 check. In a couple of the variations, that's why I couldn't play f5 because always I have queen e6 check because if mm -hmm. you can get f5 f4 in, then then he's absolutely fine. So uh, perhaps maybe he could have played something like queen c7 in that position. Then I probably have to play b3 and queen d7. Uh, yeah, and then queen d7, let's say. Yeah. And now he's got this um, f5, f4 idea. Ah, so this is the thing. He's got the idea of f5 and he's got the idea of rook e8. We were kind of thinking yeah. that you would have time for rook to e1 if yeah. he ever fought you for the e file. Sure. Then probably I shouldn't play b3 then. Yeah, if he plays queen c7, maybe I should do something quick here. Maybe I should just play aggressively with h4. h4. Yeah. Yeah. Because this g5 pawn e8, yeah, um, in a long run, yeah, it's a problem because, you know, I could attack with h4. f5 pawn is weak. As, f5 square is weak as well. So perhaps, yeah, I have to play some more aggressively with, with uh, h4 there because, you mm -hmm. know, b3 is too slow. b3, queen, b7. If he puts the rook on e8, he's absolutely fine. So I should play actively with h4. Okay, let's say queen, b7. Mm -hmm. And now rook e8 is again coming. So I have to... I have to do something, maybe rook e1. Yeah. And then you can take on b2. Okay, play this position. Perhaps I have some some attacking chances. Mm -hmm. one, yeah. one of the things... But you're right, it's still not totally... Oh, go ahead, Sorry, Amon. Yeah. One of the things we speculated was maybe Daniel was like, he was flying out of the gate with the moves because he just played a bullet match uh, oh, in the, yeah, in the time break. Fast, so maybe yeah. he was playing very fast and yeah. wasn't sure if that affected things because one thing you have to remember is that your match is still to come. But Danny already had this match. Do you think that like played a, a factor oh, in? in yeah, I, I, I don't know, about it, but I know that it was pretty fast. I know Danny is a fast player. He plays a lot of blitz and chess.com. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I don't play as much, uh, you know, and I'm not very like, for, for example, on bullet, and I'm not very fast, you know, that kind of time control. But uh, right. I'm just trying to keep up with him, and to, I kind of like my position. It was type of position that I enjoy playing. It was like a Benoni structure and. I felt like I was always uh, doing okay. Probably I, I, I didn't get much out of the opening. I, I missed this 94 move. It was a great move by him, 94, and the, trading the knights. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Probably that I definitely helps Black. G5. Yeah, yeah. I should have probably played Bishop G5 or something. Right. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was interesting after that. I like this uh, H4 move I played. Queen E3. Uh, the point of Queen E3 in that game was very important, actually, because if he takes, the whole point is I take with the pawn. F takes E3. And then he cannot defend uh, D7 threat. In order to deal with this, yeah. And I think I'm at least winning the exchange there. Or... So, so Bar, I, I have to interrupt you for a second. Um, sure. The match is starting soon, and I encouraged all your fans to join the match, but you also actually have to join the match okay. yourself. Okay. I told everybody to join except for you. Okay, and then I, okay, I need to log in, I guess. So, or... yeah, you have to be in live chess still. Okay. And if you go under tournaments, okay. Um, you should find an, an upcoming uh, I see, tournament. I see him registered there. 
There he is. He's in another it now. Another login has been detected. Let's see. Where is it? Okay, you're in it. You're I'm in it now. Okay. I see you now. Okay. It's good. Play live, All right. Let me go play live chess. Yeah, it's a little bit yeah. new. This what we're doing today, so it's kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. I think it's new for everyone. I do mean, I need to. Okay, I'm at live chess. Do I need to do anything? No, nope, you're set now. We I'm can set. we can okay. see you in the we so, can see you in the. Do you guys know what's the format now going to be? Is it going to so, be? You'll play a two-game match, two game a match, ten minute plus two second increment, ten minute two second increment uh -huh. against John D, the eleven-year-old uh, young Chinese young player, player, young player that uh, bought four for the pandas. Okay. Yeah. Just two games, basically. Just two games. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, we'll ask you. How do you feel about um having your team's fate rest with uh, the fans? Because I mean, you're only going to be able to score, you know, one or two points here. Uh -huh. And uh, they're going to be, they're going to be playing, you know, 20, 30 games. Oh, I see. Oh, the fans of each team playing each other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but I think, uh, yeah, we are defending champions, so I think it should be, should be a lot of fun. I well, we just hope a lot your of fans fun. are as yeah. good as the players are. Yeah, that's the. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah, we have good fans, and yeah, we had great team. I didn't play much this year, this season, because. Uh, the way the ratings work when Fabiano and Vesti was playing, my rating yeah. was too high to be able to play. Yeah, so I only got to play just one, I think, one regular season game. Is that just annoying to have those guys on your team? You're like, <laughs> no, come I mean, on, guys, yeah, go play, go play in Norway chess and let me play the match. I did play one game, and you know, you know, but uh, no, we had a, such a good team. I mean, a strong team. We also had Benjamin Bok, who played in the finals. He played mm -hmm. as well. So it was another, you know, we, we had a long uh, roster, you know, not everybody got to play. And, but I think still the most important thing is that the team won and became, uh, you know, twice a pro chess league champion now in the last three okay. years. So, but you're I'm okay sorry. with, you're okay with Wesley and, and Fabi playing yeah, a yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah. And if whenever okay. they're not available, I'm happy to step in, you know, so. Okay. But you're not looking for chances to make them unavailable. No. <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> These guys are too good. <laughs> Okay, and uh, what what are your chances against this uh, Chinese guy? Do you think he could uh, surprise you? Yeah, I think I, I don't know him too well, but I know he's young, talented, and he's got. I think he's coached by the uh, Li Chao and uh, yep. Yep. That's Yu, right. So I read about that. So I think it's you know you, you you never know how the games will turn against these players because they they will be you know they're probably uh, he's probably underrated by a few hundred points so probably like 23 2400 strength at least so so yeah. I'll, just, you know, I'll just enjoy the games and uh, try to continue to play well so i remember it felt really good to be like the unknown you know 13 14 year old player playing people 200 points 400 points higher than you who didn't know how good you were does it feel bad playing against playing against a kid like do you feel worried as the gm playing the new guy not too worried it's just you know uh, especially in this kind of format, it's not like you know, I could have just prepared and you know, I just in this format, no, I mean, in, in a slow, regular tournaments, it's just harder, it's just getting harder and harder, especially like if you go to some of the European tournaments like Gibraltar. I played a lot of very strong young players from China, from India, and it's, it's difficult to play them because they're well prepared, they know a lot of theory, and uh, the fact that you're maybe two, three hundred points higher, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be able to even win the game. So you have right. to work ex extremely hard to win a game. Sounds like you got the right attitude. Um, your game's going to start in one minute, okay. maybe 70 seconds. Okay. So um, good luck. We'll let you get Thank your you. game face on. Thanks. Sounds like you got the right attitude. And right. Uh, good luck to the whole team. Thanks, Thanks guys. Mm -hmm. Good luck. All right, I'm on. So he sounded ready to me. I, he didn't yeah, sound I mean, upset about playing a kid. No, I uh, I would uh, wager that's partly because VAR has uh, probably so much experience, especially being in the the St. Louis area, uh, just playing these these kids when they're they're so young and and talented that he's now uh, kind of numb to the sensation that he's probably lost so many games to to an up and coming kid, and he's probably won so many, so he's he's ready for it. So it's not the end of the world anymore. It's not like oh my gosh, I lost to a kid. You yeah. know, once, once, you once you've done it lose. once, then you're good. Got it. Yeah. Well, I tried to rattle him a little bit, you know, but I don't think I succeeded at all. <laughs> no, he's too, uh, too stoic. Yeah. Cool. So starts in less than one minute. All right. Looking down the sides, we've got a 
we've got a slightly bigger match than the first match, I would say. Goodness. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. But I think that's reflective of the um, the size of the, the fan clubs. Um, yeah, the first match was 20 against 20. And now what do we have? Maybe like maybe 35, 40 players. Well, St. Louis has like um, way more than two, like two times the size, the club size of, mm -hmm. for example, San Diego um, or San right. Francisco, almost three times the size of San Francisco. And Chengdu has almost 400 members as well. So um, yeah, they, these guys are definitely coming out in bigger numbers. All right, so we will definitely not be able to, to follow all of this stuff here. But, um, but uh, you know, hopefully we'll cover a few, a few games. We'll see, we'll see VAR here with his third white in a row. We didn't, we didn't ask him about that during the interview, but in the break, you know, he, he agreed that he was licking his lips about getting to play white all day. Yeah, I, I was wondering if he actually knew that the fans had earned him the whites because he, he said that it was lucky. <laughs> so I wasn't what sure was if he actually knew. Ah. Oh, well, then he's in for a nice surprise when he gets like all whites next week as well with their huge fan club. <laughs> yeah, he's just going to think that he's the luckiest player. So maybe we don't spoil it for him. <laughs> That's true. That's such a nice feeling. <laughs> Cool. All right. So, I mean, that's, that's the game I've got on screen for the first, for the first game here. looks like a Bogo Indian from a uh, Jang D. Yep. Um, I don't know. Well, maybe that, I, maybe that opening is considered fine now, but uh, I'd be happy to face it. Yeah. The VAR is taking an approach, which is just like very, very classical, like E3, you know, that when the Bishop's on B4 and you play this A3 line, um, I'm actually used to, Uh oh, I just lost your sound for a second. I'm on. Can you hear me? But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, he's going to pretty classically. Just put that bishop out. Everything's looking a bit white, and uh, he's just going to castle. Okay, I don't know if the sound was just messed up for me for a second, or for everybody. Uh, I. I think maybe for actually I don't know the answer, but I didn't hear yeah. you for a little bit. Okay, too. I hear you again. So, um, cool. Um, okay. Well, you were saying I think it slowed down and then sped up. I think you were saying that you were very comfortable if you had white in this in this position. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. I would. I would be happy with the white pieces. Um, he just played the move c six, and I think you know he, this. B pawn is just going to be backwards for, for mm -hmm. most of the game. Right. So white's got a pleasant choice between like something like queen B3 at some point or a move like A4 and leave a pawn on B5 and, and restrict black's pieces. Yep. Yep. He looks like he's got a very nice position. He's going to castle, play queen E2, rook C1. And uh, I just, it looks like a, a serious uh, position already for, for far just out of the opening here. All right, we've got someone saying that they've already won a free point for the pandas in the chat, but I still see the score is zero zero. So we'll we'll see if that happens or not. Um, both teams have a couple titled players um, playing for them as well, under twenty two hundred titled players, some CMs and some NMs, FM. Um, and we should also mention that we've got Gold Dust Tori I, playing her second match of the day. She also played for San Diego earlier today. She's streaming uh, these games on her own channel as well. Um, so she's giving sort of like the fan experience for anyone who wants to, you know, watch that now or later. The the experience of being a fan playing in one of these matches. So is she um, going to be playing uh, pretty much every week. I think she is planning to play every week. I don't know that she'll make absolutely 12 out of 12, but uh, the big majority, yeah. Um, so be interesting to see what it's like for a fan to play through a whole a whole season of this and see what she thinks of the different teams, if she, I she think has any preferences. Uh, I was wondering if she had preferences or, or it looks like maybe she's just going to take whatever team has less players. Mm -hmm. Maybe so, yeah. Be sort of like the house player in a sense. Yeah, exactly. 
I used to direct tournaments, so I was often the house player, basically mm -hmm. fill in where needed. Well, those are very, very appreciated by those extra fans who are looking for a game and looking to get in. Yeah, I think the the worst feeling here would be to like come to play a game and then not get paired. Yep. Um, so she's she's helping out with that as well. Yep. Um, this game here, it looks like uh, Sicilian, where she lost the E4 pawn at some point. Which does tend to happen in Sicilian. Why well, can lose that E pawn? Um, well, how exactly did it disappear? Ah, okay. Let well, us see it. At least you can you can take solace in the fact that a move thirteen bishop was played because you want to conserve the bishops. So yeah. it's like good intentions, right? That's always the best kind of blunder, I think. Yeah. Good positional intentions. Um, and now she's going to have to still fight for those e4 and d5 blockading squares in the Sicilian, just as if you had an e4 pawn. One way or another, the goal is you want to keep that black center from mobilizing. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, if you guys want to check out how that goes for her, you can check out her Twitch channel. Yeah, We're going to pop back to Verusian and try and learn a little bit more because he's uh, been giving out some lessons today. Um, so a4 locking in b5 and giving up the b4 square. Yeah, I think at some point you have to sort of choose something like this. Um, it looks like maybe black was was on the verge of uh, trying to kick the bishop out. Um, and then maybe going for b5. So maybe he felt like it was time to do that. Knight a7 trying to get mm -hmm. b5 and b4 potentially. Right. Interesting. It's also a question of how to progress if we don't play a4. Because if I play a move like rook c2, then on knight a7, I can't play the move bishop d7, which I would want to play. Um, right. So, I mean, white's also got to decide at some point between putting rooks on the b file and doubling them on the c file. So, it's actually not so easy. Um, instead of bishop uh, a3, um, what do you think about knight uh, e5 mm -hmm. and then presumably rook c8 is yep. being played and then I'm going to take everything and okay. then play rook c1 and I want to say that my king reaches c4 as quick as black's king reaches um, c6 Okay. That this should be a, a much much better endgame for white yeah, I wonder if Black could just play b5 right away in response. Right, that's the question. But, I mean, I'll just take it. I mean, that's a pawn. Right, I know you'll take it. So now I'll play a4. <laughs> right, takes a4. I suppose, in this case, I think I would just play king f1, like just bring my king, because I don't see a way this pawn advances all the way. Okay, king f1, a3. Yeah, king e2. King, yeah. And I'll just plant my bishop on a1 and bring my yeah. king over and take that. Yeah. And if my logic is that I can't play b5, my king does reach c4 as yours reaches c6. It just seemed like yeah. a, a way to completely trade everything off. And honestly, it looks like a winning endgame to me. Yeah, I, I see that. I don't see anything for um for Black to have done about that idea either. Right. So anyways, it's a reinforcing <clears throat> thing. So it's not something you're always on the lookout because... Um, you know, you're not even out material in that position, but it, it did seem like a good option. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, he's got a nice position, right? Backwards pawn, knight coming to c4 next is a, is a big, big threat. Right. All right, so trying to deal with, with that in advance, getting b7 defended, looking at knight c3. Um, hmm. how do we go from here as white? <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> not sure if um, king f1 is just a nice move to, to make, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for example, but seems like black's doing fairly well. I would say as long as black has the c5, I would be surprised if black were much worse. I mean, I understand the b6 one's a little bit weak, but the rest of it seems pretty active. Yep, I guess... Um, yeah, no, there's not really, because e4... 
knight c3 always hits everything in the position, so it's not it's not like e4 ever takes anything with tempo. So I mean, he's playing h3 here, but I don't see how white improves mm -hmm. the center. You know, like black can just sort of play king f8, king e7, f6. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought white would have to somehow get the king to d2 and play rook c1. Yeah, progress maybe. from here. Frankly, I, yeah, I don't see white's advantage. Maybe he should do that. But if he were going to do that, why play h3, right? Yeah, I definitely, uh, definitely agree there. <laughs> hmm. Maybe Var doesn't see white's advantage anymore either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time's about even. So, I think if there's one thing I've noticed about this Chinese player, is he's very fast. Yeah. All right, let's pop through some of the other top boards in this match. Uh, Iranian Cheetah playing white against Keith Honsky or Keith Honsky. Uh, that looks pretty cool. I like it. I like both players' positions. I am a big fan of Black's position. Um, mm -hmm. Right off the bat, feels Possibility. like uh, ninety four is yeah. There it is. Feels like ninety four is an automatic. Yeah, I don't really want to take that. <laughs> well, he just so. blundered with Bishop D two and Knight F three, I think. Okay. Well, Bishop takes D four was also losing material. Yeah, I think he had to play queen e1. I mean, e1 was his one square. Yeah. Then he would never be able to take on d4 either, though, right? He would <laughs> yeah, just sort no, of... not a nice position at all. Oh, but there's rook f3 here. How, how clear is this? Hmm. Rook f3. Cute move. Yeah. Rook takes Amazingly, d4. if rook d2 and takes on f7, right. at the end there's even bishop to e3 discovered check. Um, 100%. So um, this might super fail. <laughs> it looks like bishop takes f3 might simply have to be played. Okay, and then on rook d8? Yeah, and then just take take d8, play the rook against the, the pieces as a result. Ooh, that's tough. That's tough to play. Wow. I think there's still reasonable chances. Like, I'll play queen g5. And well, I have queen c1, if queen g2, and otherwise I might play e4 and try to like just get the rook in there or something. But no, certainly, certainly not by design. Say that. The queen f1 was not a blunder, right? But I guess that's a that's an impressive justification then. <laughs> a surprise, not blunder. The guy has the worst internet connection maybe on the whole website currently. So we'll see. We'll see if it lasts. Uh, if the cheetah can make it through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is being played. So now you're saying you should go with this queen over to g5, maybe instead of taking the file with the rook like I had first yeah. done. He agrees with you. Probably going to go king h2. And then, yeah, I don't really have any forced stuff because queen f4, there's bishop g3. Uh, that move's surprising because of that move, exactly. Queen yeah. c1. And if king h2, then you're losing your bishop. So he's got to play like bishop or queen f1, but then queen b2, and it seems unnecessary. Basically just to lose the, the b pawn. Yeah, yeah, it felt like he didn't have to. But okay, he's going to give the check again, we'll see what his opponent does, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess he's pretty comfortable doing that. Um, yeah, no, this is uh, this is probably better for white objectively, but it sort of um, it sort of depends here. But uh, white's better. White's better for sure. Bishops are better than the rook, but 
it can be annoying, you know, when, when you don't feel like you have full coordination. Yeah. Queenie too. Well, it seems to invite Rick D too. So what's the, what's the idea? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> like Qu Queenie too. Looks I mean, I guess you could play, I guess you could play Bishop or Queen to E3 and probably trade Queens and only sack the B pawn. Not so bad. If you get the queens off the board, though, then yeah. then white is probably winning for sure. Right, even down two pawns. I mean, I just have never seen a rook hold two bishops. Right. I mean, let's say here we're only down one pawn, isn't it? Unless we yeah, lose. Right now pawn. it's only one. That's correct. Um, but yeah, he's he's consolidating here. Dangerous. Yeah, so now I guess the A pawn instead of the B pawn, maybe? Yeah, because now bishop E3 doesn't work. I take the queen and go rook E1, so queen E3. Yeah, queen E3 is forced now. But the annoying thing is that, uh, you know, if I take that and take the A pawn, I'm worried that the, I think the bishops just win there. Yeah, I would expect they would. I mean... White will have a move like bishop d5. So he's going to go for this and keep queens on the board. He's going to retreat his queen after king g2. Yeah, I think queen f5 probably. Yeah. Sounds good. Hmm. Hey, pop back on an, on bar. Right. See if he's gotten anything out of this. Knight c4, bishop c6. Knight to d6. Knight c3. So really this fighting for this b5 uh, square. This looks fishy for VAR. I have a, I have a feeling this, this is a little fishy. Like things get bad, right? The knight on d6, Jang d wants to trap it. He, he doesn't even want to trade things with bishop d5 there, right? He's yeah, no, going for I, king I think the knight could be trapped. I mm -hmm. think there's stuff to be very concerned about, like maybe king e7 here. Mm -hmm. and oh, the a pawn is also a potential victim, right? Which could be a big deal. Oh, yeah, exactly. Now, that's why I think that the dust might settle with the knights, but the pawn is just going to be there forever. I think king e7 is a good move here. Okay. I'm, I'm somehow convinced by it. Okay, you're happy to just trade the knights on c3 and d6, and then you've got the a pawn as a target in that endgame. I think so. He, he, his yeah. move here may prove to just be like a like a super version of my move, <laughs> uh, knight e4. Mm -hmm. Look, it looks like a great move. Um, yeah. But I think regardless, I think Var is in like serious trouble here. Well, this move might be super strong. Actually, this could be major trouble for for Var. Maybe bishop uh, uh, b5. It's one of the only moves here. Uh huh. Yeah, bishop e5 might be the only move. There's just so many scenarios where if there's a normal trade like on e4, mm -hmm. Var just can't untangle the c file, period. So it's gotta be yeah. really yeah. there's only a couple moves that aren't gonna lose to that. You know, knight b5 loses to bishop b5, a b5, knight d6. Mm -hmm. Um, so several ways to lose. He goes for bishop takes e6. Hmm. one move that jang d better have calculated carefully but apparently hasn't so king e7 mm -hmm. i guess he's gonna go for for this king e7, I don't know here. Why. King e7 now maybe king e7 now right <laughs> and then bishop g4 i suppose yeah i'm not sure why i'm really not sure why Could he have played bishop d5 instead of king e7? I think he didn't like bishop takes d5. And then rook c1? You mean rook takes c7? Or sorry, what, what move are I'm you saying doing? with the, instead of king e7 on move 30, if he played bishop takes d5, he seems oh, to just win. Uh, bishop takes d5, right. Yeah, just instantly over, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like the, the thing is, there's, there's no world where this works for, for black. Um, or, or sorry, works for white. I don't know. 
where like I don't know why we're even playing actually because okay. uh, I feel like some things were missed there by Shang Di. Yeah. It looked basically the position looked decisive. I have to say. Yeah. It it did. Yeah. All right. Instead, the end game is going to continue here, right? With Rook and Minor against Rook and Minor. It's not easy at all. Um, we're going to see like Bishop D one, mm -hmm. and King E two, and and then it's like the Bishop is really good at watching the A pawn and also dealing with the King side pawns. So mm -hmm. I imagine we're getting closer and closer to some position that could be considered equal. But um, Black is probably pressing here. If I can trade yeah. the Rooks, get the King to B four, Black is doing super well. Gotcha. All right. So maybe um maybe rook d6 to slow bishop d1 a little bit. Right. Um would be logical. Uh we're gonna pop over to Gold Dust Tori again for a moment here. Um so now she's got black against Pokemon, who's missing a chance to have a uh, a Pokemon icon. Yeah, big miss there. It's a blank avatar, and it's a blank right. canvas. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's people who don't even have Pokemon as their name who have Pokemons as their avatars. So, yep. All right, <clears throat> we'll see what we think of this position. We've had a piece traded on D4. Um. Well, knight takes and four. Knight like takes E4 is the big question in this kind of position, right? Yep. It looks like it works. All right, let's give it a shot. Knight takes e4, bishop e7, knight d2, bishop d8. I'm tempted to play knight takes c4 before taking on d8. Are oh, you okay with that? Definitely right. what I was thinking, yep. We're good with that. Go there. Take on d8. C takes d4. Kind of equal-ish endgame, <laughs> right? Pretty equal, yeah. I mean, knight e4 is one of those moves that's like it looks exciting for a moment, but I think it makes sense to trade on C3 first, like Tori did, because um, basically now you don't have the pawn hanging on D4. White still has to recapture on C3. However they do, you may still have the move knight takes E4, no? Yeah, uh, unless... Um... Yeah, queen takes C3 was played. And here she played B6, but now knight E4 should have been on. Yeah, knight E4 probably worked there. Yeah, you're checking bishop F7, king F7, queen C4, D5. Yeah, um, it, should, it should work. Um, if pawn takes e4, bishop h4, that's how black, that's sort of the basis of this tactic, everybody, is there has to be a bishop for white hanging on like g5 or h4 to go for these knight e4 tactics. Yep. And um, yeah, knight e4, you always have to check bishop takes e7, and then either you have to take their queen or capture a piece while attacking their queen or king and then recapture on e7. Yeah. Uh, which we can do here. Condition satisfied. So that's a good opportunity that um, if she has a coach or if she coaches herself by looking over her games again, that's what she wants to... One of the things she wants to notice is that opportunity to go for 94. Queen B3. The pretty big move there. What's that? I said she just missed a pretty big move there. Quit that Queen B3 was attacking at 7. Right. It was defendable, defensible. With rook f8, but now it's going to be rough. Now it's going to be rough, and Var is down to ten seconds as he tries to defend this. Ooh, I think King c3 was the right move before. Maybe it doesn't matter. It looks like Jang D has like the upset. Yeah, it wasn't looking good. Wow, wow, an impressive end game from the youngster. Um, let's let's click through some of that, shall we? I mean, their next game is going to start like instantly. That's how these matches work. So over here, Chang Di hasn't realized it yet, but he's got another game to play. He's white. He's got to be so pumped from that upset. Right. I hope I didn't rattle Var with my questions. I didn't. Right? He didn't care what I asked. <laughs> I'm I'm just so uh, so confused here. In about what oh sorry i thought we were looking at the end game oh yeah sure we can definitely i'd love to um let's see if we can click through some part of it in reasonable speed and get on with the live game so 
he played king. Oh, he didn't try to keep the bishop away from d1. He tried to trade rooks. Yeah, that I felt like that was going to be the first thing he did. Um, nice. But there's no great way for Var to keep his rook either. No, it seemed to me like um, what I thought would happen was bishop f3, rook c7, rook d4. And then the king would move, and then you go back, maybe like rook c4, or just leave the rook on d4 then. Um, okay. But then once you allow knight e6, it's such an right. annoying move because it stops rook d4. So now it's like, ah, I don't have a choice anymore. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess I'm take... a little surprised after knight e6, he didn't go king d3 and say, like, all right, we can trade, but, you know, let me get my king up to c4. Yeah. Okay, so things continued. He wasn't able to win this right away, but he goes and breaks the f4 square on the king side. And once Bar's king moves away from b4, that's going to be a loss. So did he have no way to hold this eventually, I guess? Oh, it was really tough, huh? Yeah, no, it, it looks fairly forcing. It really does. Um, wow. Although... If I had to say a move, it would be maybe move 59. How is, uh, how is bishop d5 check? Bishop d5 check. Because uh, you want me to go to king c3, and then you want to go back to c6, right? Uh, but I've got a3, bishop b5, a2. Sorry, so I, I guess I, I said move 59, but I guess I meant technically move 60 for white. Oh, sorry. Okay. So bishop d5 there. So king b4, b4, and now bishop d5. Yeah. And uh, I want to say king b2, king c4. Right. And then no matter which pawn you push, I go king b4. Like, I have a feeling this may, might be drawn. Yeah. Even if he played king c2, you would have sort of the same idea of taking on a4, and then when they queen, you check on, on e4. Yeah, exactly. Like, a, I think that, well, first of all, allowing king c3 is just a, like a no. Like, if you let black play king c3, you shoulder the white king and you play uh, one pawn up, uh, usually yeah. the b3, and then save your a pawn. But it looks to me like if you play bishop check first, and mm -hmm. then you come with the king to, to c4, uh, you seem to be just in time. So anyway, he was clearly down to, to seconds uh, at the time, yeah. but it, it just looked like... Uh, earlier, he had that end game I pointed out, where I think it was almost like, in, in some ways, quote unquote, like a forced, really good line for White. Uh, and then here, it looks like we can hold a draw. I'm not sure though. Yeah. Yeah, I tried King A3 for Black. It doesn't seem to be winning either. Yeah, B2, King C2, and and King A2. I I just wait basically. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well. Let's see. Uh, let's That's see their next. Uh, very, very impressive. Let's see their next game. Yeah, I mean, in any case, even if there was a save for Bar, I mean, the kid had, you know, pushed him with black from a tough opening. No, absolutely. Had multiple chances to win the game. Played some good technique in the end game. Put a lot of pressure on him. So, yeah. All right, English opening. Kid's not afraid to get positional. Yeah, I think um, I think these positions always tend to be a little bit better for for white. Um, it's really hard to orchestrate a trade of the light square bishops, and there's not really any positional deficiencies. Probably black goes for stuff like knight e7 followed by d5, um, and and try to do that, but. Again, this is this this bishop on g two is always going to be so so good, and as you open the position up, it, it always will favor the bishops a little bit. Mm -hmm. Ninety five is uh, an idea now. Yeah, yeah. Just leave that d five bishop slightly superior to the g six one, but trade a little bit of the pressure off. Yeah. Yeah. 95. <clears throat> now this, uh, 
I mean, slightly better for white, but it's nothing like insane. Um, he goes 97. I think the other move was 95, but um, 97 followed by d5 looks correct. Mm -hmm. And there it is, as foretold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this h4 and bishop on f4 doesn't make a good impression because like, uh, I just I just don't know what the next move is. Yeah, I thought the fight was for the h file uh, for for the e file, not the h file. Um, I don't know. You can play a move like h4 once everything's under control, right? And you're just restricting them one little bit more. Mm -hmm. But uh, here with the rook on f1, there was there were other things to do. I think. It's just that the move h6 restricts the bishop completely on that diagonal. And if a knight ends up on d5, there's no way you're keeping a bishop pair, basically. Uh -huh. There's just no way. Yeah. No, this looks like a very good uh, game, but I have to say that the other game looked very good as well. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, is that it all <laughs> always starts that way, but can he maintain it is the only other thing. Um, because last time we saw Zhang Di basically just stay in the position, and then uh, when it got a little bit tactical, he, you know, he handled it very well. How about rookie two here? Mm-hmm. It took me a long time to find this move, so I hope you don't laugh at it. <laughs> Rookie two. Okay. Well, I mean, let's say I let's say I grab C four. Right. So one idea is for the pawns to trade on C four, and if Black trades on D two, which might be naive, but if they do, mm -hmm. then in the resulting position, this knight on E seven is not yet good. So I've got some time to use my bishops. <laughs> Right. Um, okay. And the other side of the idea of rookie two is if black does nothing, I want to play rook f e one, and start pressuring e seven with the idea of taking on d five. Mm -hmm. Yep. That looks uh, that looks fine. Rookie two probably uh, probably black's going to take because I think he wants to move his knight. Mm -hmm. um, so it feels like that's got to be the the correct move the only other idea is bishop g4 or bishop h3 but i'm just yeah. walking into a, like a permanent pin yeah bishop h3 is definitely asking for rookie one bishop g4 <laughs> makes some sense bishop e6 might be playable but you still have to decide whether or not you're taking on c4 there yeah i i think uh i'd probably take c4 takes and then maybe like trade the queens and play like bishop e6 or something mm-hmm Kind of asking you if you're going to go bishop d5 or not right i was really planning to just double rooks on the d file but well, that maybe yeah, if you have to play bishop maybe crazy I, guess I, I have a choice there but probably the opposite bishop end game just can't be that bad for me mm -hmm. Knight yeah. takes bishop d7 yeah yeah Okay, but cool. I like again, this. Trading like, uh, in bishop e6 makes some sense. If that happens, though, it's like, can VAR really win that position? And is no. Zhang Di going to be upset with uh, with a point and a half? Uh, at a I don't think black can win that position against white having to pass D pawn in the opposite colored bishops. Right. Yeah. Well, one thing we can say about the uh, the match is although it's, although it's fairly balanced, mm -hmm. uh, back and forth in terms of ratings. I think the Ch the Chengdu Panda site did have like sort of a higher rating on most boards. Seemed mm -hmm. to have just a little bit higher on every board and they've opened up like uh, an insane lead. Like it's- Oh my goodness. Double. It's almost like it's 39 to 21. It's almost double the score. I would say. Yeah, the score hadn't updated for me for a little bit. So I didn't realize it. And I saw somebody in the chat saying that, you know, the pandas have sort of a crushing score. And I was like, just looks like a couple points against a couple points, and then suddenly it updated with 39 points for them. Right. Wow. Um, yeah, they've got... They've got... Well, there's a lot of matchups in the middle that are pretty equal, but... 
Yeah, I can't even tell. They're not in exact rating order, so I'm not even sure. Yeah, I think it's because nobody has like a defined rating in this time. Oh, they must all have provisionals. And then, yeah, you know, just from the first rating. round wins, they go up. The first round losses, they go down. And suddenly the order looks weird. Exactly. So it looks like they're way out of order, but actually they started in order. Yeah. All right. So he traded on d5 and tried to keep his dark sword bishop on e5. Uh, you said this bishop would not be able to escape being traded once knight d5 happens. So is f6 coming here? Uh, that's what I envisioned. Um, yeah. This looks like an F6 moment. Uh, it does weaken the square, so then he can say, oh, I'll go back bishop f4, and now, mm -hmm. you know, if you trade, then, then those light squares around the king are definitely something you may regret. Right, but he is sacking the d3 pawn this way, right? That's true. Knight f4, maybe queen f4. Yep. Queen takes, queen takes d3, or bishop takes d3. I don't even know. Either should be fine. Yeah, queen d3, though, it just runs into, like, rook d1 and gets super awkward to keep defending that bishop. Okay. Yeah. Like maybe it just wins the piece after queen c2, rook c1, and another rook to d1. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it could be. All right, they got some moves played. Let's see what they did. Bishop h3 was played first, actually, not this f6 move we were thinking. Bishop g2 trades that. Well, there goes the bishop pair too. And I like that move. It's it's very good to get rid of the light squared bishops by force there. And then Vars got queen f5 here as well as an option. Mm -hmm. It also pick a pawn there. It feels like um, this idea of trading on d5 and playing bishop e5 was not going to be good, right? The bishop's just a target there. It's not It's not doing anything useful. Yeah, it's not good at all. No, what we see here is uh, is a bad position for for white and good knight. Good knight on d5. This looks really uncomfortable here, uh, David, because as you pointed out, the pawn on h5 is falling, and that's not even it. I might even like prefer the position if, even if that pawn wasn't on priest, but it just sure. better, better. Yeah. It's not like you've got something better to do than take it. You would take it, but you like Black's position no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. I don't especially like D4 either, since Black can always play F6. Let's just... Let's go with a couple more light squares, in my opinion. Um, and maybe activates the Rook on C8 <laughs> in the yeah. worst case. Yep. Yeah. Um, C takes D4 might be just as good as Queen H5. Yes, I, I was just about to say though, when I when I see D4, then the move F6 becomes very tempting because it's like it's, it's really, really really running out of squares here um, mm -hmm. for the piece. So let's say Bishop F4. Or... Yeah, that's what I expected, but it just came to D6 anyway. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah. E6 looks a little shaky just because there's like queen d5 check. Yeah, there's knight takes c3 was an option, but Var just played c4. Yeah, I think Var is going for like a, a more cutthroat approach where he's saying like, listen, you can, like, I'm not going to take that pawn on h5. I don't need to rush into that. It's there for me all the time. And it's right. really hard to imagine it being defended. So he's probably going to take and play rook e1, and he's done that. Uh, now queen h5 could be played. It would guard mm -hmm. the rook. Oh, yeah, that's slick. Better than trading rooks and then playing queen h5 when there was a little bit of shenanigans. Queen yep. e6, queen c8, maybe queen c4, depending what happens. Or Yep. So this uh, this is definitely very, very good for black. However, yeah. um, he's, he's uh, also nursing something else, which is like a six-minute time advantage. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think that's like uh, also something to take into consideration here. Yeah, 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 that's looking good for him. Yeah, no, this looks uh, this looks very good. Centralize the queen. This is going to be probably a very textbook win for for Var. Mm -hmm. It's tough to see the queen activating while uh, taking care of the counterplay. Like queen f three hits both pawns here. Yep. Um, after knight takes c three, knight to e two is just going to win the game because f two is indefensible. And 
it looks like any check uh, on like queen b5, queen e8 is just met by king h7, and there's just not another check in sight. There's no follow ups. The bishop is just not doing anything. He's just sitting That's there. Right. Wow. Right. Just, just grim. Well, that move doesn't stop the knight c3 d2 idea particularly. <laughs> it encourages it. It says, please, <laughs> please. Yeah, knight c3, this is over. No, it's like, as far as like, sure, encourage me. Mm hmm. 92. 92. Oh, yeah. pawn as well, but 94, very clinical yeah, as well. I like because it's just like queen f2 is unstoppable, but 92. Yeah. yeah. This is all over. Yeah. So where's the mate? That's the question. Yeah. Knight g5. Yep, you found it. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't that hard. <laughs> yeah, I thought it might be harder, but. Yeah. And what he's gonna go queen uh, queen f3 looks like queen f3 king h4 f5 That's you, could also do, you could also yeah. do queen e2 yeah i was gonna say he could do this and queen e2 okay he's really going i mean the the, the poor white queen and bishop they're just doing absolutely nothing <laughs> first the bishop was doing nothing then the queen joined him and was like let's do nothing together yeah, romantic mates here but queen h2 is the one one move mate there it is all right all right check out this game with me d hassel mm -hmm. uh, dale hassel who i've played before against jay lee and it looks like white's trying to do some decisive operations his own king is not completely perfect but he's trying to just finish things off here right dale's actually from my uh, my city uh in calgary here that's right um and he's was he up up a pawn here right and he won the first game okay there's threats of bishop g7 and rook f8 so that's why he played bishop e8 however can't necessarily say that uh position is so tremendous here Maybe rook b8 to b7. Seems a little slow. That looks like a more direct move. Okay, well, that can't be taken because of the bishop g7 you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's a surprising move. Oh, I thought he was going to take on c6. Well, I don't, I don't get this move because. Yeah. It even risks opposite colored bishops. Well, it's all the opposite bishops. Uh oh. oh this is just a draw. <laughs> Somebody's win slipped away. This is not correct. This is not correct. You even it could it could be any debtor. Another intermediate move there. Oh. Draw offered, draw agreed. All right, on to Bonnie Lee. Bonnie Lee and the chess boy. The chess boy. The chess boy. White is down a pawn. Pretty good pawn down position, though, I have to say. Feels like the rook and king are enough to draw it, right? Yes, it definitely feels drawish. That's um, the instinct here. I'm trying to find ways to win for black because it's quite, you know, king takes f6 is just so simple. All right, we've got fan questions in the chat as we as we look at this end game, asking after we play our two games, is there more? Are there more games for the moment? No, for the moment there are no more. Uh, there are no more games tonight. The next match is next week at the same time, five p.m. The first club match, six fifteen ish the knockout, six six fifteen the knockout, and seven fifteen the second match. And you're speaking um, in the Pacific time there, right? Yeah, this is all in Pacific time. Basically, same times as now. Anyone who's playing today should hopefully know what time it is. Um, there is an after show with James Canty coming up, um, you know, in about five or 10 minutes once this is resolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the thing for today. We're going to watch the last one or two games on unfold here. And then it'll be over to James and... Uh, if you want him to look at some of your losses, I would be happy to. And uh, 
yeah, if you want to participate in that, just stick around. We'll raid, we'll raid his channel when we finish here. And if you don't want your two losses to be scrutinized, if your goal is to not learn anything from them, then uh, you know you can you can sign off now or go play some more games, and just mm -hmm. make sure not to analyze them afterwards. <laughs> Wouldn't want to learn anything. Yeah, very dangerous. All right, any other games still going here other than this one? I'm not Mixed seeing Seattle any others. Chess. Just mix Seattle's chess. Oh, there's Paul Greer and Chess Nine Twenty Six. And right, MC Seattle. All right, MC Seattle's got five seconds, and a nice extra C pawn. Yeah, five seconds and a winning position makes it exciting. Oh, okay. Uh, but he's in that that thing that happens to me all the time, where you just start making random moves when you're on the increment. I mean, just it's good. look around in circles six times. Then. He came up with the plan, though. He did it fast enough that he went from five seconds to 15. That's what I don't do. I just keep <laughs> making random moves for the rest of the game once this happens to me. Well, that's a good job. Now he, uh, she, rather, uh, earned the win. Oh, man. Her speed is, uh, is strong. Yeah, this is very impressive, by the way. <laughs> she definitely knows what she's doing. My goodness. Uh-huh. Nice. Oof. Nail in the coffin. And that's a 2-0 for MC Seattle Chess. And it looks like Bonnie's one of our last games. Oh, yeah. never mind. It just ended Bonnie's, in a draw. Bonnie's game just ended in a draw. The other game I clicked on just ended. Chess and Paul Greer finished I here. And uh, I think St. Louis had more players to start the match, but the match ends in a considerable Pandas victory by just about 20 points here. Um. Yeah, I don't know what the story was. I don't know if they outrated them. Maybe more Maybe on these bottom boards, but we're never gonna be able to see all the games, especially when there's more of them uh, in this match. But yeah, uh, somehow what I noticed was that Chengdu was just outrating. Uh, St. Louis on most boards. Now again, everyone's provisional, so it's hard to say. So maybe yeah. what happened was everyone was just super underrated on the, the Chengdu side. Yeah, and the, the rapid ratings may be super provisional for a lot of people. Maybe as people play more over the course of the season, we will uh, we will start to see sort of ratings that we can put more faith in. Right. Um, but yeah, for now, um, for now, it's a big win for Chengdu. They get three points for that. Um, plus they got a point from Jang D getting third place in the knockout. So they get four points today. St. Right. Louis Archbishops got their own three points from uh, VAR winning the knockout. Um, and no so from the, from the group. Yeah. And so I don't know that San Diego got any points, but they I didn't think, any. No, I think it's they... something like San Francisco five, Chengdu four, yeah, and St. Louis three. Something, something about like that. Well, um, I see the standings there on the screen, so you're actually calling them out perfectly. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, um, so very close between those three teams this first week. Hope that was fun for everybody. Um, stick around if you want to analyze some fan games. We've already covered the uh, the pro games, so if you want to stick around and check out some fan games with James Canty. We'll be rating him in a moment. Yeah. Um, and yeah, next week, the same four teams will be playing. Pick your club wisely, whichever team you want to support. And uh, I'm on. Any closing thoughts here? Well, it's just uh, you know the first week of this new format, so I can imagine it's only going to get more popular. You know, More people are going to show up. More fans are going to show up as they say, like, hey, wait a minute, like this is actually something that's that's going on that I need to make time in my schedule for. So I expect, uh, David, that the club matches are actually going to get um, much bigger as the as the weeks go on here. And um, I think uh, we'll just have to see if that's the case uh, in the next weeks. But it was a lot of fun. Cool. All right, everybody, if you played a good game, blog it. If you played a bad game and you chose to learn something from it, blog it. Get out there and be the best fan of Division A, and uh, have a great week. Bye, guys. Bye. Hey.
。BCL 是一项全球性的国际象棋快棋职业联赛，同时也是世界国际象棋职业选手的决斗场。作为东方力量的代表，成都熊猫战队已经连续两年打进了 PCL 全球四强。在我们的团队中，不乏世界超一流选手，包括像丁立人、于洋一、李超、赵俊等等，也有快速崛起的奇才新秀，像张帝、李云山、翟墨，以及国际象棋的建设者、爱好者等数百名棋手，组成了一支强大的东方军团，向世界巅峰发起挑战。二零一九年世界 PCL 夏季联赛即将打响，被数千万棋迷提供了与世界超一流选手并肩作战的机会。成都熊猫战队向全世界国际象棋爱好者发出邀请，加入我们，共同征战二零一九年 PCL 夏季联赛，向冠军发起。